Bonjour, hola, and good morning from the University of Houston. Um, we will begin the second annual Transition in Energy Law and Governance program momentarily as our attendees come on to the Zoom. Thank you. Hello, my name is Victor Flatt. Je uh, m'appelle Victor Flatt. I'm the Dwight Olds Chair and the Faculty Co-Director of the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources Center at the University of Houston Law Center. Along with my co-director, Professor Gina Warren, our Marie Skodowska Curie Fellow Oban Zhao, the organizer of the Transition in Energy Law and Governance Project, and Alfonso Lopez de la Osa Escribano, who is head of the US Mexican Law Center here at the University of Houston Law Center, I would like to welcome you to our second annual symposium on the transition in energy law and governance. Our program is funded by the European Commission under the H2020 program and the Marie Sklodowska Curie Actions. And we are uh, presenting this and working on the project in conjunction with the University de Léon, toi, Jean Moulin. Um, I would briefly like to introduce our speakers. So first I would like to uh, show you that um, our speaker, our full speaker biographies um, are uh, on our website, uh, which is at www.law.uh.edu slash Ener Center slash Marie Sklodowska dash Curie slash 2021. But if you just get to the inner center, <laughs> you can find the link uh, to the 2021 program and you can read about all of our speakers. So just to tell you a little bit about the speakers we'll be hearing from today, we have a remarkable uh, panel uh, of speakers and I'm so grateful uh, to uh, uh, our, our fellow Oban Zhao for gathering this remarkable group together to talk about a very important topic. Um, so I'm just going to uh, go through them in the order of the speakers. Um, so uh, our first speaker, uh, actually, I'm, I'm going to go in the order that they are in the, in the uh, program. Um, Sonia Carly is a DePaul H. O'Neill Professor and Director of the Masters of Public Affairs Program at the O'Neill School of Public and Environmental Affairs at Indiana University. Her research focuses on electricity and transportation policy, energy justice, a just transition, and energy-based economic development. Tracy Lynn Field um, is, um, excuse me, um, is the full, is a full professor at the University of Wittgenstein, uh, um, and an advocate of the High Court of South Africa. Her work focuses on the law and governance of extractives-based development, climate change, water, and earth stewardship. She is the author of State Governance of Mining, Development, and Sustainability, and the lead editor of Climate Change Law and Governance in South Africa. Professor Louis de Fontenelle is an associate professor at the University of Pau. Um, after spending one year in the company Tarega, uh, a SNAM subsidiary and a major participant in gas transportation and storage in France, Louis joined the Pas Droit Public, the law uh, team at the research at, at PAO. A significant part of his work is addressed in the energy transition. He co-leads the research program at PAO dedicated to energy law. Salil K. Sen, Dr. Sen is, uh, has done many things over the course of his career. Um, he's consulted with the Asian Development Bank, UNEP, um, he has a Certificate on Sustainability Practice Global Classroom from the Earth Institute at Columbia University, which we work with here at UH. Um, and he has played, he, he's studied a lot of work with disaster resilience. Uh, he's been a visiting fellow at Tsinghua University and the University of International Business uh, and Economics at Beijing. He's also been a visiting faculty at the University of Redlands in Southern California and the Institute Man Telecom of France. Um, 
Bernadette Laboe-Ferrese is a full professor of law in the Faculty of Law at Jean Moulin University de Lyon Bois. She is a member for the Center for European Studies and a fellow at the Comparative European and International Law Team at Jean Moulin University Lyon. She is also a research associate at the PAU Public Law Research Center at the University of PAU and the Adour countries. Over the past 15 years, she's been conducting research in energy transition and law and policy. She's written many books and articles on the subject. And in addition, she is the co-lead of this entire project. And I want to particularly thank her for all of her support as we continue uh, during the project. Professor Afonso Lopez de la Osa Escribano is the director of the Center for US and Mexican Law at the University of Houston Law Center and adjunct faculty here at the University of Houston Law Center. And he's been with us since 2017. He has been a professor of administrative law at the University Complutense of Madrid in Spain uh, uh, for 10 years. And he's been an associate professor of public law at the University of Pau et de Pau de la Dour. Uh, he focuses on comparative and international law aspects, including European Union law. Tom Mornhout is an adjunct assistant professor at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs and a resident scholar at uh, SIPA Center on Global Energy Policy. He also leads the Energy Subsidy Program at Johns Hopkins Initiative for Sustainable Energy Policy. And he holds two master's degrees and a PhD from the Graduate Institute of International and Developmental Studies in Geneva. Um, Obao Nzao Congo uh, almost needs no introduction, at least to the participants on the program. Uh, he is our Marie Sklodowski Curie Fellow in Law and Energy and Policy, a researcher here at the Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources Center uh, and at the Center of U.S. and Mexican Law at the University of Houston Law Center. He's also an assistant professor of law at the School of Law uh, de Droit at the University de Lyon Droit. Uh, he is a researcher for the Center for European Studies and a member of the research group on comparative European and international law. Dr. Jenny Stevens is the director of the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs and the Dean's Professor of Sustainability Science and Policy at Northeastern University in Boston, Massachusetts. She's also the director for Strategic Research Collaborations at Northeastern University's Global Resilience Institute and is affiliated with the Women's Gender and Sexuality Studies Program and the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. That is uh, an introduction, I believe, of our uh, speakers for today. We're very happy to have all of you with us. And now with that, I am going to turn to an introduction of our program today. Let me stop my share here. All right. Um, for the second year, uh, due to the impact of COVID-19, our conference is virtual. But COVID-19 has not only forced our programming to a virtual platform with co-commitment benefits and drawbacks. Uh, one of the benefits, for instance, is that we have participants from literally every continent in the world with the exception of Antarctica. But COVID has also affected the very topic our project was meant to address. What now for the energy transition in a COVID altered world? Um, in early 2020, the world literally shut down when amidst deep uncertainty, the COVID pandemic spread, cases immediately increased and mortality rates were out of control in many countries. The situation fully illustrated the profound interconnectedness of our world from the health system to the energy system. Just a year before that, it appeared that the energy sector was accelerating its transition to a lower carbon economy. How and in what way did the world's experiences with COVID-19 change or alter that forecast? The year 2020 marked the beginning of the UN decade of action to achieve sustainable development goals by 2030. These goals have the ambition of ensuring access to energy for all, effective response to climate change, and building resilience against major crises. However, the launch has been affected by the disruptive effect of COVID-19. COVID-19 has at times severely paralyzed government, government initiatives, and many governments found themselves almost powerless 
in the face of a public health emergency that has turned into a global health crisis, arguably the major health crisis of our time. In addition to the suffering from death and illness, COVID has pushed more persons into extreme poverty and around the world has hollowed out development and the middle class. COVID thus reminds us of the imperative need for economic recovery. But will this recovery be green, inclusive, and decisive in supporting or hindering our ongoing energy transition? COVID has also opened many eyes to the flaws in international equity and development and persistent racial, ethnic, and gender gaps. Just one year ago today, George Floyd was murdered in the United States by security officers. And we've seen uh, an increase in discussions and concerns about equity. Will this concern of equity and the concerns of equity and gender justice with COVID push the energy transition to a more just and equitable outcome? Many countries have put in place ambitious or relatively ambitious energy policies. Many private actors have recently reinforced their commitments to low carbon energy sources, and some jurisdictions in the context of climate litigation have reminded states of the need to comply with their international commitments or to put these international commitments into place, to put energy policies or strategies that integrate resilience to climate change and work to mitigate climate change. So what does this all mean? What is the state of the energy transition in a current context public health emergency? What is the energy landscape today in COVID? In particularly in terms of infrastructure, supply chain and investments? What is the state of the climate commitments uh, five years after the Paris Agreement? What about renewable energy? What are the opportunities for our relevant players today? And what are the trends in terms of economic recovery and subsidies? What about green bonds? Will they be enhancing the effective transition? And what is the current state of progress in access to energy? Our best practices developing in the private sector? Will government regulation follow along? What are the opportunities for offshore methane hydrates or green hydrogen? There are many questions that we will be discussing today. Um, and I welcome you again to the presentation. A couple of housekeeping items. The, uh, you may ask questions through the Q&A function um, those questions will be moderated by the moderators, which will be Professor Gina Warren and myself, and uh, also uh, Oban Zhao. And we will look forward to answering those questions uh, at the uh, last 15 minutes of each session. Um, additionally, this program has qualified for 2.5 hours of CLE credit in the state of Texas and, and uh, potentially other jurisdictions. Um, after the um, program is over, um, all of you will be sent a link uh, to ask if you would like to receive CLE credit and instructions on how to do that. Um, and the, uh, at least in the United States, our CLE credit um, depends on the um, Zoom webinar uh, function of tracking attendance. So uh, just so you know about that as well. So with that, I would like to turn the program over uh, to uh, my co-director of the Inner Center, uh, Professor Gina Warren. Thank you. Thank you, Victor. Thank you so much. I'm thrilled to be a part of this program and to moderate our first panel. And um, so without further ado, the first panel is governing the energy transition between momentum and convergence of crisis. And um, our first speaker is Dr. Field. Thank you, Gina. I'm just going to share my screen. Uh, can you all see my screen? So uh, good afternoon, good morning, bonjour, bonsoir. It's almost bonsoir here in South Africa, uh, in Johannesburg, 15,000 kilometers away. And I'm indeed honored and privileged and pleased to be able to present today, which is Africa Day. Um, the day uh, 58 years ago that the governments of Africa came together to uh, liberate the African continent from colonial oppression and work together for the economic and political integration of Africa and restore the dignity of every African woman and child. So it's an auspicious day and uh, very topical that I'll be presenting on energy transitions in the COVID disrupted Africa. 
So my presentation has three parts. I first want to look at the nature and the scale of the energy transition in Africa, and then turn to the extent of COVID disruption, and then just bring together some thoughts on the effect of these disruptions on the African energy transition. So a, a transition requires a movement from one condition to, to a future state. And I, and I want to start with that future aspirational state, which uh, for energy has really been defined by the people of Africa in the form of Agenda 2063. So the Organization of African Unity was superseded by the African Union. And in 2013, the African Union drafted this Agenda 2063. The, this program intends to prioritize inclusive social and economic development. And that's a topic I'll return to at the end where we look at the, the access to electricity in Africa and ask whether it is facilitating inclusive development. But the 2063 agenda, a vision for, for energy is really one that is going to be based, energy systems that are based on renewable energy resources, coupled with a strong and lo largely localized manufacturing sector, highly qualified human resources, integrated energy infrastructure, universal access to modern and clean energy, convergence to address extensive energy inequality, sufficiency and responsible well-being, with the idea that Africa's energy uh, use will increase while wealthier countries will, will reduce their energy usage. The African Union has formed the African Energy Commission to, to pursue this vision, um, and they're a specialist, specialist agency of the AU. And in 2019, the African AFRIC, I will refer to them, uh, passed a strategy, had a strategy approved, which rests on five pillars. And the last of these, the Africa Energy Transition Programme, is really central to the topic today. The key thrusts of this program uh, center on renewable energy systems aligned with climate change commitments under the Paris Agreement and decarbonization of the electricity sector. There's a strong emphasis on natural gas as a transition fuel based on the, on the reasoning that Africa's gas reserves are largely untapped. It's a useful backup source for renewable systems and then aligning energy sector development with infrastructure, key infrastructure, uh, with key economic sectors and regional collaboration, development of a strong renewable technology manufacturing sector and so on. But I think the key thing I wanna highlight is this emphasis on renewable energy systems and with natural gas as a stopgap. The, this strategy, the AFRIC strategy, articulates a number of guiding principles. I want to highlight just two. The first one is a emphasis on African leadership and ownership to mobilize the continent's own resources for development. And the second is a precautionary principle against being locked into carbon intensive pathways. So the strategy calls for leapfrogging. You have a picture there of the African rain frog, leapfrogging to the best available smart modern distributed energy systems. So that is, that is, that is uh, really the aspiration that by 2063, the vast majority of Africans will have access to modern energy resources based on renewable, renewable sources. What about the status quo? So Africa has abundant renewable and non-renewable energy resources, but at present the startling statistic, uh, 1 billion Afri 1.2, 1.3 billion African people uh, use less, than, less energy than 20 million residents of the state of New York. Another statistic I picked up, uh, all the energy produced in Africa uh, is less than that produced in Spain. So statistics compiled by AFRIC, and this is one of their core mandates, is to have reliable Africa-based statistics, show that um, so total energy supply has increased from 2000 to 2017 uh, in the order of 115%, but statistics show and I'm going to highlight these two squares, a persistent and slightly increasing reliance on low quality traditional energy sources. So firewood, charcoal, biogas, agricultural residues. Africa is the only region in the world where firewood and charcoal production have increased over the last two decades. And the top three producers, uh, which are responsible for two thirds of firewood production and a third of charcoal production, which is Nigeria, Ethiopia, and the Democratic Republic of Congo, and Nigeria being one of Africa's key oil producers. So the, that's, the, that's the state of play. Um, most energy is, is produced by these sources. Uh, 
oil production has remained, has increased, but African production of crude oil has declined. And of the approximately 400,000 kilotons of oil produced in Africa in 2017, 77% of that was exported. Natural gas production has, has increased by about 41% uh, with development of reserves in West Africa and Southern Africa. And then that's just a general picture of the energy supply by fuel. You'll see there um, coal, coal and nuclear have remained um, virtually constant and that is really uh, largely located in South Africa. Hydro has increased slightly, but it still accounts for less than 2% of total energy supply. And what is most um, disappointing and sad really is that the contribution of renewables remains negligible, less than 1% of total energy supply is, is based on solar, wind, geothermal. So that really um, is the state of play in terms of energy supply for electricity. You can see there, um, here you can see a greater, the renewables comes into sharper relief, um, but most of the electricity produced in Africa is really from fossil, fossil fuel thermal resources. This slide just, just brings together some information from the World Bank's report on electricity access in Sub-Saharan Africa, which shows that the electricity access is the lowest in the world, 43%, which is half of the global average, that this severely this constrains modern economic activities, provision of public services, and quality of life. It severely limits adoption of emerging technologies in sectors such as banking, education, agriculture, finance. And on this side of the slide, you can see here that the 31 countries in Africa have less than 50% access to, to electricity. So the, for me, the, the, the two key thrusts of the energy transition in Africa are firstly, moving rapidly away from plant-based energy sources to modern energy services based on renewable sources. And then secondly, ensuring that the development of oil and coal and gas on the continent truly benefits Africans and is not tied into old models of colonial extractivist developments. And I've just um, put together, I'm not going to go in detail through these, these projects, but this is just a very short list of the oil and gas projects that are currently in the pipeline. You can see a significant investment in gas and the kinds of players that are involved. So that is uh, really the aspiration and the status of the energy transition in Africa. And I now want to turn to COVID disruption. So the first COVID case in Africa was on Valentine's Day in 2020 in Egypt. And since then, official statistics put the number of infections at about 4.7 million people with 128,000 deaths, which is very low. 128,000 deaths is the same as the United Kingdom and Italy. And so at the initial stages of the pandemic, people were theorizing as to why Africa seems to have been spared COVID. And a number of uh, theories were put forward, including that the effect of early lockdowns imposed by African governments, the, the very young age demographic of the African continent, the weather, the fact that there's higher temperatures, a cross reactivity with other coronaviruses. But as the pandemic has unfolded, the realization is that this is really a underreported. So the official statistics don't accord with the lived reality of Africans where there have been, they've experienced so many more deaths in their communities. And research studies now in excess deaths and zero prevalence have shown that these statistics are far underestimating the number of infections in Africa. For example, last week, the South African Medical Research Council re released a report which showed that there were 160,000 excess deaths in, in South Africa from April last year to May this year. And a study of seroprevalence in Malawi, I can just cite one study, there are others, showed that um, in May, June 2020, 12.3% of the population tested for seroprevalence for COVID-19, but official statistics at that time only recorded 0.003% of the population having, having had COVID. So the, the suggestion that Africa has been spared COVID-19 is a dangerous narrative that overlooks the fragility of healthcare and public administration systems on the continent, 
both of which are inextricably linked to modern energy services. In terms of the economic outlook, the initial uh, predictions were that Africa would be quite severely affected. Many governments in Africa imposed very early lockdowns. You can see in that graph in the bottom left-hand corner, there were predictions, an, an UNCTAD paper from July 2020, um, suggesting that the an average, uh, because of the effect on economies that rely on primary commodity exports as well as tourism, that in general, in, on average, the African economy would suffer by 1.4% contraction. Um, AFRIC issued a special report on the impact of COVID-19 on the African oil sector, where they predicted that major oil economies like Nigeria, Angola, and Algeria would suffer a $20 billion oil loss in 2020. And this is not even taking into account the, the social and environmental externalities associated with oil production. Um, at the IMF's January, January 21, 2021 statistics show that it predict that on average, African economies have contracted by 2.6% with the major economies of Nigeria and South Africa contracting a lot more. However, these statistics do not really capture, um, sorry, do not really capture the toll that the pandemic has exacted upon Africans, which have included job losses, food insecurity, lack of access to public services, and the scourge of gender-based violence under lockdown conditions. Uh, scientists, scientists have also linked uh, air pollution, which you know obviously is associated very, very closely with plant-based sources of energy with increased severity of COVID-19. I turn now to the last part of my presentation, which looks briefly at the impact of COVID-19 on the energy transition. And two intervening considerations need to be highlighted. The first is the debt burden. So there is consensus that the pandemic has increased Africa's already debilitating debt burden. According to IMF 2021 statistics, Africa's external debt stocks have increased by about 134% from 2009. Um, the debt burden has both been affected by the contraction of, of revenues, as well as skyrocketing government expenditure on healthcare and welfare on welfare payments. And the African Development Bank estimates that the average debt to, debt to GDP ratio in Africa is expected to climb by 10 to, 15, 10 to 15 percentage points. And this increased debt burden has made the prospect of borrowing money for energy infrastructure development even more difficult. Sorry, I'm getting my head of myself in the slide. Sorry, everyone. <laughs> The second related factor is the, the pandemic's effect on infrastructure spending. So this is related to the debt burden. Uh, according to the African Development Bank, Africa's total infrastructure needs per annum are in the order of 130 to 180 billion US dollars. And the primary source for funding this infrastructure is public finance. So the clear impact of the pandemic is that there will be less public monies to spend on energy infrastructure as governments reprioritize expenditure in favor of healthcare and welfare payments. And because borrowing is going to deepen the debt crisis, there is a strong emphasis now on developing alternative sources of funding such as infrastructural bonds, development bonds and commodity backed loans. Uh, there is a strong emphasis on a resilient and uh, bullish and sort of growth oriented Africa. The, the narrative of green growth and in Africa is being taken forward by a number of organizations. Um, at a recent investment conference, the president of the African Development Bank has said that investment opportunities in the energy sector offer opportunities of $100, $100 billion per annum. Okay, in conclusion, uh, the COVID-19 has made the need for an African energy transition even more imperative to cope with the healthcare burden inflicted by the virus and to participate in the new unusual forms of social engagement, Africans need access to modern energy services. And this cannot take place while half, half the population of, Af of Africa doesn't even have access to electricity. There is a pan-African vision for modern energy services on the table, which, which prioritizes renewable sources of energy and the people of Africa must, must ensure that they are not derailed by uh, investments that just prioritize vested interests and distracting policy reforms. Uh, we really need to get the foundational forms in energy on the ground going. To conclude, finally, I just have two sort of aspirational slides. And the first one is this, 
This is a, a, a graph showing um, it's associated with the concept of vaccine nationalism and showing the, the date at which various countries in the world are expected to have herd immunity. And you can see that the vast majority of countries in Africa are only gonna achieve herd immunity in 2023. And if anything the COVID pandemic can teach us, it is that we are not safe until we are all safe and we are not protected until we are all protected. So this really is a tipping point for the world to change their relationship to Africa. Um, and then finally, um, I don't know if any of you have seen this wonderful documentary. It's a South African documentary. It's called The Octopus Teacher. It's about a man's a relationship to an octopus and it won the Oscar for the best documentary. And the, the central theme of this, of this documentary, the boon that you take home, is the possibility of regeneration. And so I want to leave you with that, the possibility of regeneration and renewal for the African continent um, within, the, within a new global order. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Dr. Fields. That was great and very informative. Next up is uh, Salil uh, Sen, who will discuss the energy futures point of inflection, re-nuclear and health assurance. Um, Dr. Sen. Thank you very much. Uh, I would uh, begin saying that this is a very, I'm very honored uh, being humbled amid the spectacular presence here. Uh, but yes, uh, given this position, I can look at this problem from a totally unconventional man. So, Let's see what are some of the key words uh, we are uh, engaging with today. Uh, there's a pertinent need for transition. COVID is here to stay and that has altered whatever we do. And then given that there is a lot of inequity which is spreading very fast, we need therefore is good governance ethics for to guide the energy transition or to channelize the energy transition in a proper way so that it gathers momentum and converges various issues. This is what I learned. I would remember my learnings from the Earth Institute, Columbia University uh, dichotomy here. So based on this, I wrote up this uh, paper on energy futures point of inflection, the RE nuclear with health assurance. RE here is renewable energy. Now, I was searching for some relevant literature here because renewable energy and nuclear cannot be put in parentheses so easily. But I could get some close uh, association when they are talking about impact analysis and grid dynamics. We are very used to grid where the inputs may come from different sources. So let's see if we have a possibility, we can parenthesize renewable energy with the nuclear. But the major challenge here is the safety issue. Nuclear somehow is stigmatized with the lack of safety, at least in the minds, in the minds of population, in the minds of policymakers, in the minds of insurers, and in the minds of finances. So nuclear is facing a lot of challenge there. But here comes the other side. If we look at the problem from another lens, I'm using the word point of inflection. So we have two pathways. A point of inflection is either beyond that we go ahead or we come crumble down. So in order to justify this use of this phrase here. So I saw 
carbon capture and usage and carbon capture and storage, these, these technologies enable the continuity of carbon emitting thermal and gas-based energy. So basically there is a lot of coal, lot of gas. So what people are doing, countries are doing, already huge in assets are in place, huge uh, talents are there, a lot of financing is there. We just can't expect it to close down shop. Aspirationally it is great, but practically. So people are using, using a point of inflection there. They have come across with a new technology, carbon capture and usage, carbon capture and storage, so that the emissions at least is controlled, which is the most uh, thermal energy and gas is accused of that particular unwanted outflow. Apply this analogy here. Renewable energy and nuclear, if it could be combined in such a manner that the renewable energy forms as a firewall of safety around the nuclear energy hazards. I have to explain this point. I will do my best to convince this audience here. But before that, I can have a look at what are the three characteristics, paradigm shifts we are looking at. Number one, the transition has to be quick. 2030 is not far away. So decarbonization. Second, rather than treating nuclear as an untouchable in such with an inverted comma. So can we make it a convergent with the renewable energy movement? And third is a coherence of policy. Here, if we see at a later slide, I'll come back to the previous slide, the nuclear energy, this is a report from World Bank, saying that uh, very clearly depicting the few countries, France, Switzerland, Sweden, Spain, United Kingdom, Netherlands, they were all moving not very aggressively to get, to get nuclear energy here. Some data here to support share of gross power generation really fell from 17.46% in 1996 to 10.15% in 2018. But here we are talking about a point of inflection and we are talking about that inflection point. We are mired with so many things here. On one hand, that is disaster vulnerability at its best or at its worst. We need safe renewable energy resources which will survive the disaster vulnerability. That is one. But again, looking at, uh, at the logic from the different lens, we see so-called renewable energy sources. You will all agree, hydropower is very much a renewable energy source. But look at what has happened, large hydro disasters. Michigan, glacial burst, Tapovan hydro project decimated, turned to debris over a few hours, the Yangtze River topping and the Three Gorges Dam stressed and strained. So billions of dollars have gone into these so-called renewable safe heavens. But did they survive? They did not. So what stops us to move beyond that mental block that nuclear also could be given a chance if we can couple it with renewable energy? So that's my value proposition here in this energy transition conversation. It fits in, it check boxes so many parameters. I'll just quickly go through them. One is health assurance. Health is not only having the vaccination or the medicine or 
oxygen. Health is really here, the clean air. And the clean air comes from reduced GHG greenhouse gases and even more lethal global warming gases. For it is proven that nuclear more than twice it reduces the GAG emissions. And we all know renewables is almost near to zero. So if the two combine together, then we, the, there may be synergy. The next point is we need a momentum and we need some convergence. How does it fit in here? From my research on water waste energy ownership, WWE underscore own equal to we own is a little play on that word WWE. WWE stands for water waste energy ownership, which is, I define it as the infrastructure, the interrelatedness between the three that is also pronounced as we. And this we is a proactive entrepreneurial alignment amongst the policymakers, the processors, the fintech, and the AI informed grassroots up community. So normally it is seen the policymakers are moving this way, the financiers are moving that way, the community is moving that way, hardly any alignment. So if we can align that through WWE underscore own equals to we own, great things happen. So here, this really justifies my proposition. Also, there is a huge development, pebble bed modular reactor, PBMR, really is very safe. There is no question of a core melt because Whatever is the process, it doesn't have anything which raises very high temperatures, the core melts and the water gets contaminated and so on. Costs are coming down, safety is up, unprecedented level of safety through geological repositories. And also transmutation, nuclear waste or can be converted into plutonium, which doesn't have so much of hazard power. Having said that, Let's fit in to this transition, point of inflection, good governance, ethics, momentum, and the spirit of we own. Trying to club this all together through this slide here. We need a we own through that will generate a proactive spirit, which is a must for this blend. We need a blended and aligned water waste energy ownership, which is water, waste, and energy are all very much attributable to renewable energy as well as nuclear. There has to be a feel positive leadership. These are soft side. These are soft sides of the game we are in now for energy transition, given COVID and beyond. We have to retain our growth and it also spurs self-governance. So having said all this, we have, I'll propose two momentum models. We have seen through the graph, which I showed you very quickly before, nuclear energy and economic growth are correlated. So if those two can be correlated, let's add, let's latch on renewable energy with nuclear energy and see what happens to the economic growth. And this, we come to a three very key points here, which is build back better. So if this is a schematic, it's definitely not very technical, very high tech, just a schematic which shows the renewables side by side. It plugs in energy, it controls, and it gives out uh, a very important electrolysis there, which generates water and oxygen as byproducts, supplies to the grid. This is my final slide that 
if we can combine these renewable and nuclear through three steps, excuse me, I have to get back to this point here. We have to retrofit, repurpose and rejuvenate. Here is the opportunity. We know there are a lot of existing nuclear plants which are reaching end of life. This gives us an opportunity to retrofit them, to repurpose them by adding on renewables and to rejuvenate them to fit into energy transition in a smooth manner. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I'm just gonna, all right. Um, and so I just wanna remind everyone, don't forget to put your questions or your thoughts in the Q&A for discussion after the panel presentations. Thank you so much, Dr. Sen, um, for that presentation. Next is Associate Professor Luis De, uh, De Fontanelli, who will present on the problematic recomposition of the environment the case of energy transitions in the face of the conjunction of crisis. Thank you, Professor Warren. I share my slide. Do you see the, the document? Yes, thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you, Professor uh, Warren. For my part, I'm uh, currently in the Basque country in the southwest of France, and it's a pleasure to participate um, in this debate, um, first, I, I would like uh, to, to thank um, the, the Professor Victor Flat and uh, the, the Director Alfonso Lopez uh, Ibor uh, Mayor and uh, Obinen Zau for their uh, invitation. And, and thank you, uh, Professor Warren, for, for moderating this, uh, this round table. Today, I, uh, I will uh, try to, to deal uh, with the subject, uh, the problematic recomposition of uh, the environment um, and in the case of uh, the energy transition uh, in the face of uh, conjunction of a crisis. Um, um, the, the international uh, crisis we are experiencing um, shows um, how our system are interconnected and uh, how vital uh, cooperation is. The interpenetration of the situation uh, requires uh, cross-cutting responses. Uh, today, we face a health crisis, an economic crisis, social crisis, all in the context of uh, the climate crisis. And this complex equation of crisis needs to be solved with, I think, a, a new paradigm with long-term responses to rethinking the energy uh, model. So wh what does a crisis look like for the energy sector? Um, it is well known. It could be a nuclear incident, a nuclear accident, a conflict uh, that uh, threatens uh, supply or an extreme uh, weather events. But um, the current situation is uh, very atypical because today everything is converging, health crisis, technical crisis, economic crisis, social crisis. And concerning the energy sector, this conjunction has revealed uh, mul multiple problems. F for the agent uh, themselves affected by the disease, for the consumption, which is being modified, for the investment, which are uh, being uh, redirected. In other words, uh, the entire system is affected. Um, and in, in its uh, World Energy Outlook report, uh, published on, uh, on uh, April 2020, uh, the International Energy Agency estimates that with the COVID-19 epidemic, the global energy system is experiencing its biggest shock in more than uh, seven decades. So I will try to uh, demonstrate uh, today um, that the current crisis find punctual answers through uh, emergency legislation, 
but what seems necessary is longer term answers, more structural because of the, of the systemic character of the situation. This is what I call the problematic recomposition of our environment. Um, let us first try to, to understand uh, this notion. Um, the, the, crisis, the crisis has uh, led to several uh, specific and urgent uh, legislations. Um, during the health crisis, uh, states authorities have perceived uh, the energy sector as strategic, and uh, the administration, the state administrations, have reacted to ensure continuity of activity. So, from a general uh, legal point of view, our legal systems can deal uh, with uh, a crisis. There are rules and mechanisms in national constitutions and laws. And during the health crisis, states have proved their ability to put in place tailor-made emergency legislation very quickly. Of course, there were um, some differences between states and public authorities have uh, responded differently and more or less uh, effectively. As a general rule, um, states have adapted uh, their uh, legal framework uh, during the crisis to encourage operators to focus on core tasks, uh, for example, by uh, postponing tax or social payment deadlines uh, during the health emergency period. In addition, um, from the very beginning of the crisis, some actors voluntarily activated their national crisis cell as a preventive measure and uh, defined their, uh, the perimeter of their essential missions concerning uh, their public service uh, obligation. In addition, economic actors, whether or not concerned by legal measures, have sometimes on their own initiative put in place solidarity measures, for example, uh, widening the scope of beneficiaries of the energy bill uh, deferral, or, uh, or um, uh, donating personal prote protective equipment for employees, uh, etc. To sum up, um, the various stakeholders, states, operator economies, acted to ensure the continuity of activity and solidarity. But um, this revealed an immediate and urgent responses to a serious and unexpected event. In other words, the states, the operators have deployed or conceived a legal arsenal of the crisis in situ. Uh, from uh, this point of view, um, we could say that we are now ready, that uh, we know what to do, um, that we have uh, equipped ourselves with all the necessary standards to be able to overcome any crisis. But in my opinion, uh, all this reveals an, an error of analysis. Um, however, what we experienced was only a quick and immediate response to a sudden problem. Um, um, the assumption that the emergency legislation framework we have built will be sufficient to respond to other emergency is based on the belief that the crisis we have experienced uh, was exceptional. But uh, in reality, uh, what we are witnessing today within the multiplication of the and the frequency of crisis is the problematic recomposition of our environment. Today, um, the issue, uh, the, the real problematic is the convergence of problems in a time of combined economic, environmental, health, and climate crisis, which reveal uh, uh, this problematic of global recomposition and problematic recomposition because of the long time frame in which these problems and their solution arise. The, the, the reality of the global context is well known. Climate disruption are accelerating. Inequalities are increasing as need grow. In, the, in this context, um, the term crisis seems inappropriate. Um, 
defining the events we are experiencing as a crisis is questionable, uh, given their long-term nature. If we agree that um, a crisis is a sudden and intense event of limited, uh, lim lim limited duration, um, we will agree that we are experience, that what we are experiencing uh, now is more um, aching to a crisis than a problematic recomposition of our social, economic, and climate uh, environment. This uh, also explains why we must adapt our tools to this overall uh, recomposition, because uh, we uh, cannot stop rising water with the dam. We are learning to live on water, which uh, requires adaptation to this broad change and choices, including uh, shared value and uh, policies. However, the scope and consequences of this transition um, from the multiplication of crises to a problematic recomposition of our environment are not the same from uh, an economic, legal, or uh, political uh, perspective. If we accept the postulate that the context is less like a crisis than a problematic recomposition of our environment, or a structural crisis, if we want to keep the notion of crisis, we will then admit that we do not, we do not respond in the same way to a crisis as to ongoing problem. Let's take an example to understand clearly in the field of energy, um, the very significant drop in energy consumption during the crisis may lead to emergency measures being taken to ensure the stability of the energy system by setting up a business continuity plan, for example. But it will be admitted that if the crisis becomes long lasting, the configuration of the network itself must be reviewed. Um, the law should integrate to consider the problematic recomposition of our environment. In other words, provide for long-term measures, measures that incorporate all the complexity, measures that rethink the singular relationship to our environment. All this could lead to the concept of resilience. In this context, the resilience of the energy system is crucial. Re resilience is not a legal concept. We find this notion in the physics of materials, where it's defined as the resistance of, of a material to uh, impact. Five minutes. This notion is also um, in common is um, is also in common use. Uh, where it is understood to mean moral strength or uh, the quality of someone who does uh, not become discouraged or uh, disheartened. The, the concept of resilience has also been used in academic work on ecological system. However, the, the notion of uh, resilience is interesting in the context of energy transition. In this framework, the law can help um, a system uh, to be resilient, um, um, to withstand and overcome crisis. And this is the originality of the energy system. The, the system structurally was built to work in the event of a crisis uh, by structuring it in such a way as to avoid service interruptions. In other words, um, the energy system is structurally designed to be resilient. And um, that is the new, um, the, the energy transition itself, um, uh, that means the transformation of the energy sector is based on adapting to the climate and environmental crisis. Indeed, energy systems are therefore being restructured in such a way that no crisis will affect them. The aim of the energy transition is thus to reconcile the security and sustainability of supply, the competitive nature of market, um, the compliance with environmental rules, the fight against global warming, 
um, the intelligence and digitalization of, of networks, the democratic challenge of the appropriation uh, by, the, by the citizen. Um, the, the, the objective is therefore to conduct this energy transition model while designing it in such a way that it is crisis resistant. In other words, there is indeed the taking it all into account what we evoked previously. The recomposition of an energy system in direction that allows him to take into account a durable and overall problematic. Um, this recomposition can take several forms and the debates are not over uh, from this point of view. Indeed, uh, one can keep the old vertical model, top-down model, or conceive, or conceive a new one, uh, razor bottom-up. The difficulty lies in the fact that energy transition models are not intangible. On the contrary, there are uh, there are uh, partly conditioned by um, uh, fate for the primary contemporary debate on energy issues. Developing renewable energies, getting out of nuclear power, believe in life-saving technologies, decrease, grow, uh, to what extent, at what cost. And today, it is uh, pretty challenging to predict what this uh, path will lead to. However, I would like to mention one possibility, and I conclude uh, in this way, um, uh, one possibility among others, because it seems interesting to me to um, ensure the system's resilience. It is the, the role of the consumer. In the traditional uh, shem, resilience is in the hands of the supply side. Also, we, see, we will see that citizens can contribute more or less directly to crisis resolution. Um, however, we are interested in the citizens' uh, changing role because we can ass assume that a large part of the system resilience will be um, in the long term in, them, in, their, in their hands. And finally, the complexity of the subject must be considered in its uh, entirety, because uh, looking at the citizen role during crisis amounts to questioning their role in the framework of the energy transition that is uh, taking place amid the climate crisis with all its uh, repercussions. Thank you a lot. Uh, I have finished, but uh, I can continue. <laughs> no, that's great. I. Um... I appreciate that. Did you you had additional comments, or do you want to wait until after, maybe uh, after, the Q and A? After I can I can speak about uh, um, the idea of of citizen community in um, in the in the European Union, but, but we can uh, speak about that in the debate. It's not uh, your chance. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank, um, you. thank you, Professor. So. Sorry. Okay, so next, our final speaker for this panel is Professor Bernadette uh, Lobo, Lobo Furarez. Um, she will continue our discussion on the place of nuclear power in the energy transition. Um, and I believe Alfonso will be interpreting for her today. So we'll get everybody up there. <clears throat> Yeah. It's okay. You see me. You understand me. I can hear you, but I haven't. I can't see you at the moment. Let me see. Uh, it's okay now. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Spotlight. Thank you. you. There you go. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, Professor. Thank you, Professor Flat. Thank you, Aubin. Thank you also, um, Alfonso, for agreeing to translate my remarks. Uh, it's a pleasure, it's an honor to uh, participate uh, to this event. Um, one question before my uh, presentation. Uh, for my part, I will not mention directly the COVID crisis, 
uh, but only the energy uh, transition process. So, uh, in French, <laughs> excuse me. Alors, uh, si la notion de, de transition énergétique évoque le passage en général lent et graduel uh, d'un état à un autre, celui de, de transition énergétique suggère euh, l'évolution probablement progressive également du système énergétique. Et donc, par hypothèse, cette évolution a vocation à affecter les sources d'énergie ou les énergies primaires, c'est-à-dire celles que l'on euh, considère comme étant à l'entrée du système énergétique et bien sûr aussi par association leur technologie euh, euh, d'exploitation. So if the, if the notion of a transition, of energy transition evokes a passage, so a movement generally slow and gradual from one state to another, uh, the one of energy transition suggests more a gradual dimension of the energy system. Such an evolution is consequently pretends to affect the energy sources, the primary energies, which are located at the origin of the energy system and their exploitation, the technologies that they exploit, that they use. Donc l'évolution, euh, la portée, pardon, d'une évolution sur l'énergie nucléaire vient, euh, cette question vient en particulier immanquablement à se poser. Et euh, dans cette perspective, le fait que le processus de transition énergétique actuelle soit porté par des enjeux environnementaux essentiellement n'est absolument pas anodin. Et en effet, l'avenir de l'énergie nucléaire semble devoir se jouer en fonction de l'interprétation que l'on va donner à ces enjeux environnementaux. Alors, si on, on en donne une interprétation large, les enjeux vont donc couvrir une grande diversité de problématiques euh, environnementales, euh, la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre, mais aussi la protection contre les risques environnementaux, également la lutte contre les, les pollutions et contre les déchets. Euh, dans cette mesure, dans ces conditions, l'énergie nucléaire court le risque d'être récusée. Alors que si on en donne une interprétation plutôt étroite, dans ce cas, l'enjeu principal ou exclusif sera alors la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Et dans ces conditions, l'énergie nucléaire peut sans doute échapper à la répudiation. Yeah. So um, the question here is the scope of the evolution of nuclear energy. And in particular, uh, I mean, it's especially interest, important to raise the scope of the evolution of nuclear energy. In this perspective, the energy transition uh, process is real is not insignificant the future of nu nuclear power depends on the interpretation that it's going to be to be given to these issues so professor lebo will distinguish between the broad interpretation and a narrow interpretation the broad interpretation is uh, these are the issues that cover cover a variety of environmental um, problems such as the reduction of greenhouse emissions environmental and health right risks pollution and hazardous waste and nuclear energy in here might risk to be rejected. But on the other hand, the narrow interpretation, the main issue is the reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions in the context of fighting climate change. And in this case, um, nuclear energy can escape this uh, reluctance. Donc la question de la place de l'énergie nucléaire dans le système énergétique apparaît bien au cœur des débats actuels sur son évolution. Et c'est une question que je, je résumerai euh, en une alternative. Est-ce que l'énergie nucléaire est donc une énergie de la transition énergétique ou bien s'agit-il seulement d'une énergie de transition énergétique So, um, in fact, the question of the place of nuclear energy in the energy system is at the heart of the evolution of the debate and its evolution. And in here, there is a question that uh, in, in glows a uh, nuance. It is then the energy of the energy transition, or it is the energy transition energy in itself. Alors, c'est une question qui se pose dans beaucoup d'États, qui se pose en particulier dans les pays, dans un certain nombre de pays de l'Union européenne. Et lorsque tel est le cas, il est donc légitime de chercher à savoir dans quelle mesure, si et dans quelle mesure, le droit de l'Union européenne est susceptible d'y porter réponse. Alors, à cet égard, il suffit de rappeler deux choses. Tout d'abord, que le système juridique donc, de l'Union européenne comprend de longue date un traité et même une communauté dédiée à l'énergie nucléaire. Il s'agit du traité Euratom et de la communauté Euratom, qui sont issus tous les deux d'un des deux grands traités de Rome de 1957. 
Et d'autre part, deuxième chose, euh, le système juridique de l'Union prévoit aussi la possibilité pour cette organisation aujourd'hui de développer une politique dans le domaine de l'énergie. Cette politique a été entérinée donc, par le, le traité Lisbonne et figure à l'article 194 du TFE. So this question is at the heart of the energy transition and in its several states are dealing with it right now. Uh, when it deals with the European Union, it's legit legitimate to seek how the European Union legislation is likely to provide an answer to it. So we have to recall uh, one of the basics of the European Union legal system. It is that in 1957, one of the two treaties of Rome created a very specific Euratom treaty, a very specific treaty only for nuclear energy. And on the other hand, this, uh, this treaty that has evolved, there's also the, the Lisbon Treaty after, afterwards, the, and that includes the possibility for the European Union to develop policy in the field of energy, specifically mention the legal disposition of the Treaty of Functioning, functioning of the European Union, Disposition 194. Alors, la question que je pose est celle de savoir si ce dispositif juridique permet à l'Union de se positionner donc sur le sujet de la place nucléaire dans la transition énergétique actuelle. Et ma réponse est une réponse en demi-teinte. Le dispositif juridique en question est de facto ambigu et même ambivalent. Il aussi entre donc, la promotion, on va le voir, de l'énergie nucléaire et l'encadrement de cette même énergie. So we will have to see if this legal system allows the European Union to take position on the subject and the place of nuclear power in the energy transition. Um, it's not certain because the legal system is ambiguous and ambivalent. And as much as we can in the first part see the promotion of it, we have also to see in a second part the legal framework of the nuclear energy. Alors, qu'en est-il d'une éventuelle promotion d'énergie nucléaire par l'Union européenne euh, D'abord, nous allons formuler une hypothèse et la formuler à partir de la définition même du, du, du mot « promotion », ce qui signifie euh, encourager, créer, euh, provoquer la création ou l'essor de quelque chose. Donc, l'hypothèse serait celle selon laquelle l'Union aurait une, compétente, une compétence pardon, pour effectuer une telle action. Et euh, on va raisonner évidemment ici à partir du principe d'attribution des compétences. Et donc, on se propose d'examiner la possibilité selon laquelle l'Union aurait cette compétence sur le fondement donc, des deux traités dans le cadre desquels elle pourrait s'inscrire, le traité Euratom et le traité sur le fonctionnement de l'Union européenne. So first, we have to see the definition of the term promotion that we know means encouragement, the possibility of creating, of developing something or even to create a hypothesis. And the European Union, uh, we are going to see if it's competent to carry that action. We are based on the principle of attribution of competences. And this thesis is going to be examined in two ways, according to the two treaties, Euratom and the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union. Alors, qu'en est-il sur le fondement du traité Euratom Alors, c'est une thèse, effectivement, la thèse de la promotion sur la base de ce traité. C'est une thèse qui mérite d'être examinée à la lumière des objectifs même de ce traité, objectifs pour le moins ambitieux, qui figurent à la fois dans le préambule et à l'article 1 du traité, euh, des textes donc, qui nous parlent de l'énergie nucléaire comme une énergie essentielle, des textes aussi qui évoquent la contribution euh, de Ratom au développement, je cite, d'une puissante industrie nucléaire. Alors, pourquoi donc ces objectifs plutôt ambitieux Parce qu'on le sait, à l'époque, dans les années 50, les six États membres sont plutôt favorables à cette énergie nucléaire, regardée comme une énergie nouvelle, qui est de nature à suppléer euh, les énergies indigènes qui sont à l'époque donc vieillissantes. So, about Euratom, the treaty would give indeed uh, the European Union competence to promote nuclear energy. These thesis can be supported by reading the ambitious objectives that were settled in Euratom. These objectives are already being seen in the preamble where the nuclear energy is referred to as an essential energy, as a development of a powerful nuclear industry. And these obje objectives are also included in disposition one of U U the Euratom Treaty. Uh, we have to say that in uh, 1957, when this treaty was created, the six member states at that time saw really a very favorable nuclear energy seeing nuclear energy as one of the new energies at that time and likely to replace old uh, energies, indigenous energies such as coal and enabling to achieve already energy independence. 
Alors, le fait est que les dispositions en question ont une portée euh, limitée. D'une part, parce que le traité Euratom n'implique pas que les États membres euh, utilisent l'énergie nucléaire. Bien sûr, s'ils le font, ils bénéficieront des dispositions du traité, par exemple celles qui favorisent les investissements. Mais s'ils ne le font pas, ils resteront tout bonnement en dehors du traité, mais pas pour autant en dehors de l'Union européenne. So, uh, taking into account so what was said, um, the scope is nevertheless limited. On one hand, the Euratom Treaty does not imply, does not oblige member states to use the nuclear energy. If they do, they are going to benefit for sure from the provisions included in the, in the treaty and about investment, or they will have a legal regime that is going to support them. But if they don't do, they will simply remain outside the treaty, but not outside, of course, of the European Union. Et d'autre part, donc le même traité Euratom n'autorise pas cette fois les institutions, le législateur communautaire, à prescrire aux États l'utilisation de l'énergie nucléaire. Et donc, on peut constater une sorte d'ambiguïté ou de hiatus entre des objectifs très ambitieux d'un côté et d'autre part, des pouvoirs d'action très limités qui sont confiés aux institutions euh, de cette communauté. So, uh, on the other hand, the Euratom Treaty does not authorize the community legislator, the, to, so the, the, the parliament, to prescribe the use of nuclear energy. It must be noted that there is here the ambiguity between the ambitious objectives that the Euratom Treaty settled, uh, in, creates and the limited powers that de facto um, are uh, in the institutions as a result of, this, uh, of these dispositions. Qu'en est-il de notre deuxième possibilité, donc celle cette fois d'une compétence de l'Union pour faire toujours la promotion, le cas échéant, de l'énergie nucléaire, mais cette fois sur le fondement du TFUE Alors, cette thèse pourrait être peut-être soutenue, en tout cas à la lecture de cette phrase assez énigmatique que l'on trouve à l'article 194.1 du TFUE, celle selon laquelle l'Union peut prendre des mesures de promotion des énergies nouvelles et renouvelables. Alors, oui, peut-être, mais à condition alors d'une part, de comprendre la conjonction de coordination et comme signifiant non pas une relation de simultanéité, c'est-à-dire que les énergies que dont l'Union peut faire la promotion sont à la fois nouvelles et renouvelables, mais une relation de succession. Les énergies dont l'Union pourrait faire la promotion sont d'une part les énergies renouvelables et d'autre part les énergies nouvelles. Et d'autre part, il faudrait aussi, bien entendu, classer alors l'énergie nucléaire dans la première catégorie, celle des énergies nouvelles, en considération du fait qu'il ne s'agit pas d'une énergie renouvelable. So, on the basis of this treaty of functioning of the European Union, the European Union is going to take the measures to promote new and renewable energy sources, such as Article 194 uh, state, states. We have to assume that to understand the end, so the conjunction uh, meaning uh, is not as a relationship of sim simultan uh, something simultaneous, but as something that it's a succession of events. So to classify, to classify nuclear energy in this first category, um, in consideration of the fact that it, it wouldn't be considered a renewable energy. Uh, we have to assume that this ambivalence allow uh, the European Union to promote nuclear energy in, and implement renewable energies. But here again, this thesis doesn't stand up. And I think it's there where you just stopped, right, Bernadette? I think it's there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Donc, si euh, tel est le cas, cela veut dire que cette disposition, cette expression est porteuse d'une ambivalence et donc que l'Union pourrait faire la promotion d'énergie nucléaire sur le fondement du TFE et à l'image et à l'instar de ce qu'elle fait pour les énergies renouvelables, c'est-à-dire adopter des directives de promotion des énergies et de l'énergie nucléaire avec des objectifs peut-être quantitatifs de consommation de ces énergies pour l'ensemble des États membres. So the European Union can indeed promote nuclear energy on the basis of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union and through the directives and the legislation coming from the proper institution of the European Union. Alors, cependant, cette thèse ne résiste pas à l'analyse. D'abord, en raison de l'ambiguïté même de l'expression énergie nouvelle, si on peut considérer que les modalités d'exploitation des, des énergies peuvent être nouvelles, il n'en va pas de même, évidemment, des énergies, des sources d'énergie, des formes d'énergie qui existent depuis la nuit des temps. Et puis, je renverrai aussi à l'article 106 bis du traité Euratom, euh, qui euh, rend, euh, permet d'appliquer à l'énergie nucléaire toute une série de dispositions du TFE, mais qui ne vise clairement pas l'article 194. So we are in the... the, the... The ambiguity of the expression new energies and um, we will refer to the article 106 of Euratom from the Lisbon Treaty providing the application to nuclear energy 
of dozens of articles that are in the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union, but without referring specifically to 194 dispositions. Alors, deuxième façon d'envisager notre sujet, dans quelle mesure le droit de l'Union éventuellement s'oppose-t-il au nucléaire, encadre-t-il l'utilisation de cette énergie Donc, il s'agit d'envisager l'action de l'Union comme imposant des contraintes, des contraintes aux États membres, contraintes dont l'expression la plus aboutie pourrait être l'interdiction d'utiliser l'énergie nucléaire. Alors, là aussi, deux options, l'encadrement dans le cadre du traité Euratom, sur le fondement de ce traité, ou l'encadrement sur le fondement du TFUE. So here we have to consider the EU, the EU action uh, imposing constraints to member states to apply nuclear energy. Um, and it should be uh, as taken uh, within the framework. Uh, we are going to see if it is on the Euratom dimension or if it is on the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union basis. Alors, l'encadrement sur la base du traité Euratom, deux constats, un encadrement tout d'abord qui est euh, très euh, relatif, tout simplement parce que l'objet même du cadre juridique issu de ce traité est limité, il porte essentiellement sur la protection de la population contre les radiations ou encore contre, sur le contrôle de sécurité des installations nucléaires, et d'autre part parce que son effet juridique est limité également. La Commission européenne a ainsi indiqué récemment euh, qu'une mesure d'interdiction d'énergie nucléaire dans les États membres serait manifestement contraire aux objectifs du traité Euratom tel qu'énoncé, on l'a vu, dans le préambule ou à son article premier. OK, so through the Euratom Treaty, the, the, the idea of framing the, the nuclear energy, uh, on one hand, uh, it doesn't really stand, so it's a relativity of it, because on one hand, the object of the common legal framework is limited. There is two aspects, the protection of the population against radiation, chapter three of the Euratom Treaty, and the security control of nuclear installations, Euratom Treaty, chapter seven. On the other hand, because the framework has a limited legal effect. The Commission has indicated at several times that measures banning nuclear power in member states would be manifestly contrary to the objectives of the Euratom Treaty as set out in its preamble and Article 1. So this is a, one of the European uh, Union Commission decisions. L'encadrement juridique de l'énergie nucléaire issu du traité Euratom est non seulement limité dans sa portée son objet, mais en plus il est particulier. Alors, qu'est-ce que l'on peut constater Alors, Ce droit en soi est déjà original et spécial en soi, puisqu'il distingue du droit commun de l'Union européenne, mais qu'est-ce que l'on retient en particulier ici D'une part, le rôle limité des organes parlementaires, que ce soit le Parlement européen ou les parlements nationaux dans l'exercice du pouvoir normatif Euratom, et d'autre part, une association très limitée aussi de la, de la société civile au processus décisionnel Euratom, notamment la Commission européenne euh, a refusé, euh, le, pardon, le tribunal de l'Union européenne a déclaré l'inapplicabilité d'une convention environnementale sur la partie, et notamment d'une de ses dispositions sur la participation du public, ou bien encore la Commission européenne a refusé l'application au contexte Euratom d'un dispositif qui s'appelle l'initiative citoyenne européenne qui est prévue dans le cadre du TFU. So this is the specialty of the framework on the Euratom. It's special and at the same time it's particular. On the one hand, it's limited to the role of parliamentary bodies and it's limited to the Association of Civil Society of the Euratom decision making. So it's limited uh, and, and the European Union Court related to Euratom uh, ruled that it was uh, inapplicable to the um, uh, nuclear dimension, the principle of public participation. As well, the European Commission declared that the participatory mechanism of European citizens initiative under the Lisbon Treaty was not applicable to the Euratom, uh, to the Euratom Treaty. Quant à l'encadrement par le TFUE, c'est envisageable à une double condition. D'abord, que ce traité et le droit qui en découle soient au moins résiduellement applicables à l'énergie nucléaire et ensuite lui soient euh, effectivement appliqués. Alors, première chose, oui, il y a une applicabilité résiduelle du droit du TFUE à l'énergie nucléaire. Le droit Euratom, c'est une lex spécialiste. Le droit euh, TFUE, c'est la lex généraliste qui s'applique lorsque le, euh, le droit Euratom ne contient pas, ne comporte pas de disposition spécifique. Et on constate que ça s'applique notamment à l'énergie nucléaire, des règles du droit de l'Union européenne, donc du TFE, telles que son droit de la concurrence, par exemple le droit des aides d'État, ou encore le droit euh, de l'Union européenne de protection de l'environnement, les directives de l'Union européenne en la matière ou les principes généraux du droit de l'environnement. So is it possible to frame through the Treaty of Function of the European Union? It's possible, provided that the treaty and the law 
um, are, are effective, uh, can, can be apl applicable here. There's a residual, applica residual applicability of the Treaty of Functioning of the European Union to nuclear energy. There is, though, an observation to make between the difference of Lex Generalis and Lex Specialis. The Treaty of Functioning would be a Lex Generalis uh, through the Euratom that would be a Lex Specialis that doesn't contain a specific provision for it. So uh, this concerning particular EU competition law, for example, that there is no exhaustive rule of competition and that it's included in the Euratom Treaty that may preclude the application of them or as well for the uh, EU, EU environmental protection law with all the principles and uh, regulations that enact and directives from the European Union legislation. Alors, la jurisprudence montre bien que le TFE s'applique de façon moins résiduelle à l'énergie nucléaire, mais force est de constater que les règles en question sont appliquées souplement. Application souple donc à l'énergie nucléaire, et ceci dans les mêmes domaines que ceux évoqués précédemment, ainsi dans le, le cadre du droit des aides d'État. La jurisprudence de la Cour de justice montre que ce droit des aides d'État va céder ou va devoir céder parfois, Pardon, dans la mesure où la création de nouvelles capacités de production d'énergie nucléaire constitue un objectif d'intérêt public. Et même chose, même phénomène pour le droit de l'Union européenne de protection de l'environnement, son application aussi peut devoir céder face, par exemple, à l'intérêt public de protection de la sécurité d'approvisionnement ou encore au principe, nous a dit la Cour de justice, principe selon lequel le choix de l'énergie nucléaire euh, appartient aux États. D'accord, donc, uh, so, yes. So the Treaty of Function of the European Union uh, applies res residually the energy, the nuclear energy. There's a flexible application of it. On one hand, we have the EU state aid law. So this legislation is not going to, um, this go is going to seed into the new ways of doing energy in the case of the creation of new nuclear power generation capacity constituting public interest objectives. Also uh, towards the EU environmental protection law, it's also going to, to seed and let the space. Yes. Alors, la question de savoir si le système juridique de l'Union <coughs> permet à cette organisation de se positionner sur le sujet de la place du nucléaire dans la transition énergétique, une double réponse pour ma part, le droit de l'Union européenne effectivement s'intéresse à l'utilisation de l'énergie nucléaire, ce y compris dans le contexte d'une transition énergétique, mais il n'en reste pas moins que ce droit est en retrait, s'agissant de la réponse à la question de savoir si l'énergie nucléaire a de l'intérêt pour la transition énergétique. Merci beaucoup. Mm -hmm. So to the question of the legal system in the EU, if it allows the, organ the European Union to position itself uh, on the place of the nuclear energy and energy transition, we have to make two observations. The EU law is interested in the use of nuclear energy, so it's not absent from discussions, including in the context of the energy transition. And on the other hand, the EU law is in retreat as regard to the interest of nuclear energy for the energy transition, meaning it backseat on the question to see if it uh, would be uh, in have an interested position in the energy transition process. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was really interesting and such a great presentation. I really appreciate that. Um, okay, so maybe if you could unshare your screen and then I'll bring the panel back on. There we go. And then maybe we could spotlight everyone here. All right. Here we go. I think. Let's see if that worked. All right. Awesome. Um, so thank you all for your presentations today. Um, I kind of have this one big question maybe to get us going here with a little bit of discussion. Um, Dr. Sin mentioned that carbon capture and similar technologies just basically enable continued reliance on fossil fuels. And they really, they don't fix the problem. And then Dr. Fields notes that Africa intends to continue reliance on natural gas, which also extends fossil fuel usage as a less emitter as compared to coal, but still fossil fuels. Um, and nuclear seems like it, be, it could be a good carbon free answer, but of course it's a controversial energy source. It's expensive to develop 
you know, significant waste issues. For example, in the United States, nuclear has about 85,000 metric tons of waste. And so the question is, is can new nuclear or nuclear become an important long-term and structural part, as Dr. Fontanelli mentioned, of the future with its cost and waste, let alone with this questionable standing with the EU member states as discussed by Dr. Bernadette. So I'll open that up for just some discussion. I'll be happy to just make a quick point perhaps about the economics of nuclear, especially in Europe, where really I've seen the cost uh, going up significantly, uh, the construction costs going up significantly and actually starting any such project is fundamentally unreliable um, to, to governments and invest in it and to private companies as well. I mean, if we see what happened in, <laughs> in the UK and in Finland, um, in the UK, the power plant, the nuclear power plant, allegedly an advanced generation has been taking forever and the subsidy they get is a subsidy that we haven't seen anymore in the last 10, 15 years. That's what solar was getting in the year 2009. It was like uh, 90, 90 quid, 90 pounds per megawatt hour of a feed-in tariff in addition to other subsidies. So just disregarding waste, disregarding safety, just the economics of it except for certain countries like China, I just don't see it working out um, in, in, in Europe or the United States. Thank you. Any other thoughts from the panelists? I was uh, trying to position it a bit differently, uh, given that you know most of the nuclear facilities are aging. So also, on, as a counterpoint, I mentioned that so-called uh, renewable, the hydropower, disaster has, is causing them to become debris in a day. So though it has, defi by definition, it doesn't emit anything, we end up with a lot of uh, economic loss with a lot of debris, it may not be uh, hazardous. So if we can look the two things in the same lens, so we can't undo the construction which is already existing, whether it's in China, in US, Germany, and we need clean energy also, and the disasters are going up. So that's what I was thinking, rather than building something new, we retrofit, we redesign and rejuvenate. I would really like to get some feedback on this. Well, I also had a question. I was thinking about the EU. Didn't Germany ban nuclear power or was it just phasing it out? Um, has that been reversed? What's the current situation there? Same, being phased out. You're, it, mute, the you're on mute there. Let's see, let me help you. Oui, Alphonse, je voulais se une traduction pour être sûr d'avoir bien compris la question sur l'Allemagne, c'est ça? Oui, c'est concrètement si l'Allemagne donc a banni donc l'utilisation de de l'énergie nucléaire. Quel est le rôle de l'Allemagne en matière d'énergie nucléaire S'il y avait bien, c'était la, 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 la pensée du professeur. Ouais. Alors, l'Allemagne s'est engagée euh, depuis une quinzaine d'années, je crois, dans un processus de dénucléarisation euh, et euh, l'a fait de façon, je dirais, un peu unilatérale, euh, c'est-à-dire sans, sans concertation euh, avec les autres États membres de l'Union, sachant que cette... Euh, décision a été prise aussi à un moment où il n'y avait encore pas véritablement de politique de l'Union européenne dans le domaine de l'énergie, c'était avant le traité de Lisbonne, et donc une décision qui ne tient pas vraiment compte du principe de la solidarité, comme on l'appelle aujourd'hui, la solidarité énergétique dans l'Union européenne, 
et euh, qui, a, euh, bah, qui a des répercussions hein, sur, euh, sur le, je dirais, les échanges intra-européens d'électricité. Euh, la France est obligée euh, euh, d'alimenter l'Allemagne avec son électricité nucléaire et l'Allemagne, euh, en parallèle, a été obligée aussi de faire appel dans une assez grande mesure euh, assez à de la production électrique à base de charbon euh, parce que donc, la production notamment éolienne, qui a été certes considérablement développée, cette production éolienne ne suffisait pas à assurer la sécurité d'approvisionnement euh, en énergie de ce pays. Et c'est vraiment l'un des, 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 des points problématiques, hein, cette question de la sécurité d'approvisionnement, donc pays par pays, et puis euh, ensuite de, de, de l'ensemble de cette organisation d'État. Juste pour que tu traduises, Alfonso. Oui, de euh, C est, c est, pardon. Il, y a, il y a une expression en Allemagne, et je crois qu'en anglais, on dirait « output of the output of the output ». C'est comme ça qu'ils il, il, la sortie de la sortie de la sortie. C'est une expression ça. populaire en Allemagne pour dire qu'ils n'arrivent pas à sortir du nucléaire en réalité. Donc, ils parlent de sortie de la sortie de la sortie. D'accord. Bon, je vais donc… Euh... Uh, so Germany uh, was, uh, yes, 15 years ago, really engaged in a process of denuclearization, done in a unilateral way, so without any type of consultation of agreement with other EU member states, and even before the um, Treaty of Lisbon that really that includes aspects on, on energy and on nuclear energy. So it was done uh, on a unilateral way. Um, this decision, of course, was criticized in the sense that it didn't take um, into account the principle of energy solidarity that has to exist. And also that, for example, France then, because Germany was denuclearizing, was providing with its own energy, nuclear energy, Germany with power, I mean, with energy. And uh, at the same time, Germany uh, start to generate electricity going against uh, again to bases such as coal and uh, the uh, wind energy wasn't enough to give uh, what Germany needed. So there is indeed here a problem of the security of uh, provisioning energy country by country. And moreover, if I can quote belonging to the European Union in an integrated and interoperable, interoperable system. And Professor de Fontenelle was mentioning a very um, paradigmatic way of saying what is Germany, how is Germany reacting to the nuclear is the output of the output of the out of the output, meaning that the exit of the exit of the exit that they did, they don't get to exit finally the nuclear as they, they wish initially they would like. Si je peux me permettre d'ajouter encore quelque chose, Alfonso, oui. j'ajouterais que cette communauté Euratom, c'est vraiment quelque chose, c'est vraiment un objet juridique très original, très étrange, dans la mesure où on parle de communauté, mais au sein de cette communauté, finalement, chaque État fait comme il l'entend en matière d'énergie nucléaire. So it's, it's interesting about the, the Euratom community, because the legal framework is the legal object is very clear. Uh, but at the same time, it's very uh, strange because it talks about community. So we, we tend to think that this is something that everyone has to deal with or, or to comply with. But at the same time, it doesn't oblige anyone to do it. So it's like a bit of a contradiction in this particular Euratom uh, community dimension. Thank you. Well, it makes me also think about Africa and their need to um, increase electricity for electricity demands, right? Um, and thinking about electricity is growing faster and there's still a lot of need and there's still a lot of uh, lack of access there. And wondering what that might mean for how long they will depend on natural gas. Any last thoughts, uh, Dr. Field? Uh, thank you, Gina. So yes, this, this debate about nuclear, I mean, it, it's really just not on the table from a Pan-African perspective. There was a brief flirtation with nuclear power in South Africa under the Zuma administration, but uh, we, we all hope that's been put to bed. Um, I, I really don't, I, I'd have to go back to look at the, to see how long the natural gas, um, how the intent it, it is to rely on those sources. Uh, our, our concern is that all of these projects that are going ahead, for example, the, the three, uh, very large gas projects off the coast of Mozambique, that this is not going to service the needs of Africa, that it is going to be, again, perpetuating colonial extractivist, um, enclavist modes of development. Um, so the, the 
AU vision is that by 2063, we'll be relying on renewable energy resources. So I, I would see that as a as a outer limits of reliance on natural gas. But um, for my part, for me, the, the, the strategy and the policy for how long Africa is going to be intending to rely on gas for electricity and whether the investments are going to benefit Africans is far from clear. Wonderful. Well, thank you. I would like to stay and talk to everybody for longer, but we're out of time. And so I'm going to turn it over to Professor Flatt. Who then I think thank will you, get the next. Thank you, Professor Gina, for excellent moderation. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, all right. Thank you. Um, great. I really enjoyed uh, getting to hear that. Um, let me see. I'm going to spotlight that. All right. Um, so it's interesting. I mean, we, we kind of divided this into two panels because we sort of we're looking at kind of different approaches, you know, sort of internationally and, and um, what, the, what the discussion would be with that. And there was an interesting focus, of course, on, on the role of nuclear. Um, and I think that's fascinating because we've seen that debate more around the world even than we have at least at a high level uh, in the United States. Um, and from that panel, we're moving on to a panel that is in, instead of looking at sort of the modalities, looking at the different ways of thinking about and approaching, right? How do we approach this energy transition? And are there lessons that we've learned from COVID-19 and how we think about and approach this? And these may be perhaps better approaches uh, uh, to move forward uh, with the energy transition. Um, so there's different efforts, ambitions, and there are diverse approaches. Our first speaker um, will be uh, Tom Mornout from Columbia. And he's going to be talking about the key energy transition needs and how COVID-19 recovery packages are performing with relation to that. However, I know he was also very interested in our last discussion. And since these are connected, I, I invite you to go ahead and uh, comment if you have a comment on the last panel and then move on uh, to your talk. Thank you so much, I really appreciate it. Um... My, my main comment was on, on I think, the, the Germany aspect of it. Um, I think, like other panelists, I, I would love to see a much more integrated approach in European Union, but I don't think we can single out Germany for its decision on nuclear. Any single subsidy uh, in the European Union to any form of energy is pretty much on a national basis, right? Sort of the idea of an internal energy market is, is aspirational rather than, than reality. And, and that's something that European countries should take serious, but let's not, you know, let's not just single out, out uh, Germany for that. Um, let me share some slides here. All right, so what I, you, you, can, you can see the title slides, just to be sure. Yes. Okay, super. Um, so I've titled my presentation sort of maintaining focus um, and, and I quickly wanted to look at sort of the key energy transition needs post COVID and just key energy transition needs generally, um, looking specifically at, at this, uh, you know, the goal of, of carbon emission reductions, right? Um, and then quickly have a look at COVID-19 recovery packages as well. Um, why I think this is useful is, is mainly because We've been reading a lot of things since COVID-19 and uh, around the energy transition, which is which is really great, right? We see European recovery packages, which is rather sustainable. We see the Biden plan, which is very interesting here in the United States, but it also treats so many elements that sometimes, you know, you kind of lose the forest through the trees, right? There's so many little elements and you don't really know. So which ones are like the key battlegrounds, right? And I kind of want to highlight here um, what those are, uh, you know, statistically. And, and I like working with, with graphs, so that's kind of what I'm, what I'm going to do in, in, in the next 15 or so minutes. Um, so this is pre-COVID-19, right? These are sort of the scenarios of the International Energy Agency. And, and the only thing you really need to do is have a look at sustainable development and stated policies, right? Sustainable development, this is the CO2 emissions, is what we need. Stated policies is what we have, presuming that uh, the commitments that countries made will be implemented, right? And so you can, of course, see that stated policies is much closer to a business as usual scenario than, than it is to a sustainable uh, development scenario, right? And this is, this is pre-COVID-19. And, and in the energy sector, we always say that things can move incredibly quickly and frustratingly slow at the same time, right? And that's kind of what we're seeing now. So what are kind of the, the key things in that 
difference between stated policies and sustainable development that we want to see. Three of them. One is coal reductions, right? So coal is probably the most important fuel that we really need to phase out, you know, not just avoid future use of coal, but even already start phasing out uh, uh, coal in, in places where it is used today, which is, you know, rather difficult because um, a lot of developmental aspirations are also linked to coal, particularly in China and, and India, right? Second one is energy efficiency improvements, and the third one is a reduction in oil, and we'll get to that. So what happened during COVID-19, right? And remember when, when oil prices went negative and people were saying this is the end of oil, this is peak oil, and so forth, it's not that simple right um so take in mind 2020 we have seen lockdowns across the world airplanes weren't flying <laughs> cars weren't driving and so forth what that did to to oil demand is to reduce it on an annual basis by about eight percent right um we've never really seen anything like that that's strong of a reduction but it's still only eight percent right so that means that 92 percent of oil kept just being consumed right um Additionally, to oil, we see that coal struggled and, and gas a little bit uh, as well, right? So definitely fossil fuels, which is the majority that we use, of course, were, were used less. And then here we see renewables was actually used more, right? So a lot of people um, kind of now so, sort of tell the story that renewables were incredibly resilient while fossil fuels suffered, right? Um, I don't think it's that much about energy type more about how we're using energy right renewables we generally use uh during the day when solar energy is available right um we use more of that at home normally we're outside of our homes during the day because we're working that wasn't the case now so we use more renewables and possibly less uh conventional uh grid electricity such as coal right so that's what we saw now how what did that result in in terms of carbon emissions right um this is it, right? So as we were saying, you know, some uh, presenter mentioned just before, we haven't seen a crash like this in, in basically 70 years and, and more. And that's correct, right? That's sort of that, that bottom line is sort of, uh, you know, these are energy related carbon dioxide emissions, right? You really see that we haven't seen that anytime before, not during financial crisis, not during oil shock, not during wars, right? But in the grand scheme of things, right? Um, it's you know, let's not pretend that this is going to do anything to our to our carbon budgets or to our carbon emission reduction potential, right? It's 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 a, a blip, right? And and the recovery is actually happening very fast. So these are kind of uh, again the IEA scenarios post post COVID, right? So pre crisis we saw that we were on a trajectory to 2030, which was pretty much um, even including uh, um, uh, the this is steps, including the, the commitments of countries, we were on a trajectory which kept going upwards a little bit, right? Um, after COVID, we actually see that this is where we're at, the blue line, that's what we're predicting, right? Um, which is very close to, to the pre-crisis level. Sustainable development scenario is, is very, very far away in terms of emissions reductions, reductions right? So here, during this year, a lot of people were, were pointing to this trend, but, but wrongly so. That trend is just for one single year. And basically, the recovery um, has, has increased energy use very quickly again, has increased fossil fuel use very quickly again, and has increased carbon emissions as well. Um, and so it's, it's kind, of, kind of important to know where we're heading and, and what exactly the big differences are um, between our energy system now and where we need to go, right? And that's where this slide comes in, just to, to put this in, in perspective, right? Um, the first three here are, are the fossil fuels. And you really notice that coal, if, if our goal is very, you know, very sincerely to move from coal, from, from um, uh, basically fossil fuels um, to, to sustainable energy system, coal needs to be reduced by a whole lot. Steps is again, you know, this, this blue part steps, this is what countries have committed to right now, right? And you see that basically it needs to, you know, the, the, the reduction needs to be far more extreme. So coal is, 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 a, is a very, you know, huge issue. Oil, same thing. What countries have committed to now is actually still a positive trend, 
right? Um, so that includes reductions of countries, but also recognizing that economies are growing, populations are growing, automobile owners are, are, are growing, our use of petrochemicals and plastics is unfortunately still growing as well. Um, so keeping into account that, uh, you know, countries have kind of so far committed to, you know, basically an increase of about 250 MTO, you don't need to know what that is. While we would actually need to see a reduction, right? And quite similar for, for natural gas, even though the actual net reduction is a bit less. And then when we look at wind, solar and, and modern bioenergy, we see that, you know, we're sort of on the way, but we would need more. So we need more investment, right? So this brings us, and, and that's kind of where the whole maintaining focus part comes in, to three battlegrounds, right? And here, you know, this is, this is probably the most important graph um, in, in the slide. Uh, in, in the slide back, right? Here we see three decades, right? 2019, 2030, our current decade, the next one, and then 40 to 50, right? And this one, clearly 2019, 2030, is the one that we need, really need to be kind of obsessed with right now, right? We should be really making sure that our investments, our recovery packages, um, and so forth, feature or, or work towards that. And when we look at where carbon emission reductions in the energy sector are really coming from, you see that the power sector is first and foremost, you know, the key sort of battleground, right? Mm -hmm. Secondarily, you can look at transport industry and, and, and a little bit less buildings, but power sector really here is, is the biggest one, right? Both in this decade and the next one. Afterwards, transport, as you can see, also very important, perhaps a bit less important this decade, but this one here is really where electric vehicles kick in as well, right? And, and where they're, you know, deployed at a, at a much higher scale. So let's quickly go through, um, through these, uh, these battlegrounds, right? And this is another important uh, graph I want to show you. Right now in the power sector, right? The infrastructure that we are using, currently, or that we are building currently, right? So we're not even looking at investments planned to be ready. We are looking at what we're operating and what we are constructing at this particular time, right? That alone would already lead to 1.65 degrees Celsius warming. So that's above the 1.5 degrees Celsius warming in the Paris Agreement, right? Um, so that basically means that even if we start being uh, super sustainable right now in everything that we do, we will need to close stuff down. That's basically what it comes down to, right? Coal-fired power plants will need to be closed down. Gas-fired power plants will need to be closed down. We will need to stop using oil as much as we do today um, if our goal is to stay within that 1.5 degrees Celsius warmer, right? And here you can basically see that um, in, uh, in graph form, right? Um, this is hugely problematic because um, shutting things down also means that you're stuck with stranded assets, that you're stuck with investments made perhaps five, 10 years ago that don't get their full uh, lifetime to sort of start, uh, start paying back those investments. Um, and we see that as a, as a fundamental challenge in, in a lot of countries who also use particular infrastructure for developmental purposes, right? And again, China, doesn't have a lot of oil, doesn't have a lot of gas, does have coal. India, same thing, um, does have coal. So we're looking at two major sort of, you know, emerging and developing countries um, that have domestic resource. And basically our question to them is please stop using it, uh, use something else, which is, you know, from an energy access point of view, from, you know, the neo-colonial uh, issue was mentioned as well. Um, from those standpoints, this is a, a very difficult question. From an environmental standpoint, that is what is needed, right? Um, Period. Um, and so the biggest game in town in this sort of uh, in the power sector, uh, which is the key battleground, is definitely solar versus coal, right? Um, and, and nuclear is interesting here because nuclear is very important in certain countries, um, particularly China, right? Um, so what a coal fire power plant can do, a nuclear fire power plant can do as well. And so in a country like China, this may, may make a lot of sense and they have become very good in sort of indigenizing um, uh, nuclear uh, technology and, 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 you know, being very sort of cost efficient at, at basically copy pasting it, but they look less at things like nuclear waste and so forth, right? Um, so, but this is the solar versus coal uh, perspective, right? And so we see that in the next decade, what we really need to see, uh, this is what, what we're 
seeing right now, this dark red thing, right? Um, that's the reduction that we're seeing right now. The reduction will need to be far, far bigger, right? And solar energy will need to be even, even higher. So that's kind of the, the main battleground there. Then of course we have transport. And if I would ask transport, uh, you know, sometimes I do that to my class. I will ask, so what do you think is most important in transport? And you will get, you will get everything, right? You will get cars, you will get trucks, you will get shipping, you will get aviation. And nobody really knows. So, so but what's the, what are the key ones here um, for, for carbon emission reductions, right? And for that, again, it's useful to look at the data and you can actually see that in terms of gigatons of CO2, passenger cars are, are the most important, right? And so, a good thing that we are seeing right now is massive investments in terms of electric vehicles, right? And COVID was important here because for example, China started phasing out some subsidies to electric vehicles, which reduced the electric vehicle market. Because of COVID, they decided to extend those subsidies. Uh, European Union, uh, the Biden plan as well. Many countries have started, you know, really investing in charging infrastructure um, and, and, and deployment. And so it seems likely that in terms of passenger cars, you know, this is a scenario we're looking at now. This is where we want to go. That actually we will be moving towards that direction. So that's good news. Trucks, on the other hand, um, is a bit more, more problematic. We don't really have any um, available alternatives yet for, for trucking, right? Um, batteries don't do heavy equipment uh, very well and very far for that matter. And aviation and shipping, definitely important, but in terms of you know, current priorities for uh, the energy transition in the transport system, passenger cars and trucks are far, far more important than uh, planes, and, planes and ships. This is just where we are heading in terms of uh, electric vehicles. We don't need to look at this. Um, and then the third battleground is uh, industry and buildings, right? And there I kind of just wanted to make um, uh, two points, which is where are those uh, emission reductions gonna come from, right? Part of that is going to be efficiency and fuel switching, energy efficiency, very important, right? We often look at energy sources, natural gas, coal, um, oil and so forth, but energy efficiency is actually um, one of the two most important investments that we can make next to trying to phase out coal quicker um, to, to really move towards a more sustainable energy system, right? And unfortunately, pre-COVID, a lot of energy efficiency investments were kind of stagnating, right? Um, and that was problematic. Since COVID, we have again seen sort of an uptick in that. So that's, that's, that's good news. Uh, we see more retrofitting, you know, retrofitting is often also, you know, a lot of manual labor and so forth. Before COVID, not that interesting. During COVID with, of course, unemployment concerns and so forth, all of a sudden those sectors become interesting, right? And that's where we get um, more energy efficiency investments again. And then the second half will be basically reducing emissions from electricity and heat, right? So now, quickly, um, in basically the last uh, minute or, or two to three minutes, if I may, um, the investment needs and where we are at right now, right? So what do we need in terms of investment needs for, for the energy transition, right? Again, as I mentioned before, part of it will, become, will be, you know, reducing emissions from our infrastructure right now. Right. So when we talk about retrofitting, when we talk about retrofitting power plants, when we talk about um, adjusting existing infrastructure, very important. And the second one is, of course, what we're building new. Right. And what we're building new, huge, important concept there, of course, is opportunity costs. Right. Um, when we relate that back to, to this nuclear discussion, if you are going to build a new nuclear power plant in Western Europe or the United States, you are deciding to spend a ton of money on something that you could probably invest better in if your goal is just carbon emission reductions over the whole lifetime of, of a, an energy installation. This I'm not going to look at. This I would uh, quickly like to show. These are sort of, you know, to, to, to take in, you know, to, to keep in mind what type of investments that we're talking about uh, here, right? Um, so, so this is what is needed for sustainable development. Let's look at sort of the next five years, right? Uh, this is annually, by the way. Um, so we're looking at the power sector close to one trillion, um, end use sectors also close to 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 one trillion uh, by the end of the decade. Uh, that would mean literally about $2 trillion of investment 
every year in the energy system, right? To put that into account, the first major recovery package in the United States, which everybody talked about as being, you know, unseen was 1.9 trillion or 1.8 trillion dollars, right? So we need a whole lot more. Right now, we're not even, you know, we're at about half of that, uh, half of that investment. So we need more and we, we kind of need it now. I'm not gonna touch on, on SOEs since uh, time is running out. My last basically two slides is to show where, where are we at, you know, what have we seen? And uh, I would refer to this website here, energypolicytracker.org. So that's something that we set up with uh, Columbia and a number of uh, non-governmental organizations around the world to do bottom-up tracking. So in each country, we look at energy policy changes, um, including, you know, fiscal incentives and so forth. Um, and we have a look basically at, at how they perform, right? And this is where we are at uh, since the beginning of COVID-19. Um, this is government, right? This is not private investment. That's very important. Um, government has been responsible for about 300 billion um, of support to fossil fuel energy and 250 billion to cleaner forms of energy. And this would include things like public transport, electric vehicles, and so forth, right? Um, and, and this graph is, is not unimportant. Um, because it, it breaks that up. And here you see that dark gray zone, right? That is what we call fossil unconditional. And so this is, this is very unfortunate, right? Because um, what fossil unconditional means is that governments basically gave money to the bailouts of, for example, airlines, automobile manufacturers, and so forth, without adding, you know, any environmental uh, conditions attached to it, right? And that's really a missed opportunity. Some bailouts of fossil fuel sectors or fossil fuel using sectors are going to be necessary, right? Airlines is a good example. They would have all gone bankrupt um, without, without bailouts worldwide. But this was a good moment to add some environmental conditions. And uh, we basically seeing that this wasn't done at all. Um, and then when you look at clean unconditional, clean unconditional is like, the truest, cleanest forms of energy, right? Wind, solar, these type of things, energy efficiency investments. We see that they're actually also still rather relatively limited. Most of the cleaner investments are in things like electric vehicles, public transport, bailing out public transport as well. Um, so that's all good in terms of keeping the economy going, keeping sectors alive throughout COVID, but they are not necessarily the big steps that we need um, towards, towards the, the future, right? Um, most of those, by the way, have been taken in, in the mobility sector, so that includes those, those bailouts. Um, one last point uh, from me is that uh, multilateral development banks, which we also track, have been doing uh, much better recently, right? And so here you can see for, for every bank, two periods, 2015 to 17 and 18 to 20, right? And if we take, for example, WPG here, the World Bank Group, we actually see that their fossil fuel investments have been declining. Right. And it's also the first period, the last three years, that the major multilateral development banks have not supported coal at all. And that's good news. And even their oil is going down, their gas uh, going down, but there they're still very much um, in involved. Right. Um, and I will stop here because uh, I already took five minutes extra, which, uh, which I appreciate. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that, Tom. Um, so now we're going to hear from uh, Dr. Sonny Carley, um, and I'm uh, very interested in, in hearing uh, the discussion about energy and security, which we know is a huge issue in the United States, and which we, uh, unfortunately, in um, the Houston area have had uh, too much exposure to in, in Texas in the last uh, three months, and, and maybe we'll see some articles in JPAM about that in, in, <laughs> in the next year or so. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you, um, Dr. Carley. Great, thank you. Let me go ahead and share my screen quickly. So yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take us to the United States, though this is a problem that is um, pervasive around the entire world. And I'm also gonna take us to the level of the household. And we're gonna think about energy insecurity for a few minutes. Um, let me begin by acknowledging funding for this project from the National Science Foundation, Indiana University, and the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation. 
So the subject of my presentation is energy insecurity, which is defined as the inability to meet one's household energy needs. Now, this is either because a household doesn't have the money to pay their energy bills or because they don't have access to electricity or to natural gas, even uh, because, let's say, they've been disconnected from their electricity or gas provider. Now, we know from a robust literature that without energy or without power, one cannot provide um, electricity to charge devices such as phone devices and phones of course provide information and the ability to call for help. Uh, one cannot also provide power for electronic e-learning devices which uh, over the course of the pandemic was especially important especially uh, in houses where, where children were homeschooled. Um, we also know that without power it is impossible to keep a refrigerator running and to keep perishable healthy food or to keep medical electronic devices charged and working. And without access to energy, it is incredibly difficult for individuals to moderate the temperature of their bodies. Um, they might become extremely hot or extremely cold. And as a result of facing these conditions, um, they can face a variety of different mental or physical health consequences, including in um, not particularly rare cases, um, the incidence of death. So uh, as just noted by Victor, this is um, very much on the minds, I believe, of those that reside within Houston. Uh, as you can see from some of these news articles, this just happened in February with massive rolling blackouts essentially um, throughout the state as a result of the pretty extreme colds um, from the frozen tundra that, that came your direction as well as um, power system inadequacies. Uh, as a result of people not having access to energy, some of them died due to exposure to the extreme temperatures, um, but also households died from their coping strategies, and that is strategies that they engaged in in order to try to keep their bodies warm um, during such cold temperatures. For example, sitting in one's car and running the car for heat, um, but when that car is also in the garage and it's all closed up, that's what can result in carbon monoxide poisoning and death. Uh, now, these, this was not an isolated incident. In fact, um, well, it was for Texas, but generally it's not. Uh, energy insecurity is, as noted, a pervasive problem across the world, and it affects people and kills people uh, on, on, a, on a daily basis, as you can see from a variety of headlines here. So we know in the United States that energy insecurity is a problem. Uh, the Energy Information Administration gathers data every several of years through what's called their RECS survey. And uh, here are just two pie graphs that come out of these data. So about 31% of those uh, sampled in 2015 reported difficulty paying their energy bills and maintaining adequate temperatures in their home. And about 20% reported that as a result of paying their energy bills, they had to forego paying for other household necessities such as food uh, or healthcare or whatnot. Now these data are incredibly helpful for giving us a sense of the problem, uh, but they're only, they're only uh, gathered every several years and they were not gathered during the COVID-19 pandemic, or at least actually they haven't been released yet. Uh, and there's reason to believe that during the pandemic, there would be um, deeper incidents of energy insecurity across both the United States and the world. This is just pulling from a paper that's a, a working paper up on NBER. And you can see here that's tracking residential and commercial energy use and the res residential energy use goes way up during the beginning uh, months of the pandemic as people are spending less or as the, their, their companies rather are spending less or their, their place of work. Um, they are spending more at their house on energy and thus we should assume uh, that the incidence of energy insecurity would rise. Now, states acknowledged this very early on and put in place many temporary protections uh, to, to tell the service providers basically that they were not allowed to disconnect um, those that were relying on electricity during this time period. So you can see from this map that many states uh, did put something in place um, though many of them have already expired. And in fact, a lot of states only had them in place for a month to a month and a half, and it's very few states, about 13 that still have an active kind of protection in place. Uh, so taking all of this information, this, this led us to ask several questions um, specifically about energy insecurity and how it's changed over the pandemic. So the first question is just how prevalent is energy insecurity? Has the pandemic made it worse? Who then suffers from energy insecurity? And what factors lead households to be more or less energy insecure? And what are the implications for those households that are energy insecure and engage in a variety of different coping strategies? So the research design that we employed 
is to collect data through a survey analysis. And this is an online survey that we've administered at four different time periods over the course of the pandemic. So here I have a timeline. Uh, we, I, I've noted that the pandemic begins in March. Of course, we know that it began before then, but this is when the lockdowns began in the United States. Um, so our first survey was administered uh, very early on within the first month of the pandemic. The second one was administered in August, which gave us information on summer months the third was administered in January, which gave us information on fall and winter months. And we are going into the field within the next several days uh, for the last round of survey administration over the course of this entire year of the pandemic. Um, this is a panel data set. And so we're actually going back to the exact same households over and over again and asking them the same questions so that we can track how their conditions change over time. And the sample is a representative sample at the national level, but it's of low income households. And we define that specifically as those within 200% of the US federal poverty line. Uh, so over time, we have a little bit of attrition of our sample. We start with about 2,400. Second wave, we have about 2,200. The third wave, we had about 1,700. Um, but we've noted that we haven't lost any sample due to the incidence of energy insecurity or any specific demographics. And we've, we've tested this to make sure this is administered by an online survey company called YouGov. And in our survey analysis, we ask, mesh, um, we ask questions about energy insecurity, personal and household demographics, household behavior, the health of the household, how they uptake or use government assistance, if at all, and the various housing conditions that they face. And in the analysis that I'll show you briefly, we use survey weights to make sure that this is as representative as possible of our sample population. Now, I'll also show you data from what's um, termed the last year, which is the year before the pandemic. So this is the year leading right into the pandemic. And then in the last month, which is essentially the first month of the pandemic, then we will compare these two things. So allow me to present these results very briefly um, based on this uh, paper that we published earlier this year in Nature Energy. So first, uh, here I've presented three different measures of energy insecurity, the, um, and they're in severity. So the, the least severe is when a household can't pay its energy bill. Um, the middle level is if they receive a notice to be disconnected. And then finally, the most severe is if a household is, is disconnected. Um, so here I've compared between the last month, which is orange, and that is the first month of the pandemic, versus the last year, which is the year before the pandemic. And what you can see here is that the orange bars are about half as large as the blue, which might give you solace, um, but it actually is deeply unsettling to me because that's just one month versus an entire year. Uh, we can see here that about 25% of um, this low income population wasn't able to pay their energy bill before the pandemic and about 13% um, faced those conditions in the first month of the pandemic and about 12% were disconnected the year before the pandemic and about five, five or 6% were disconnected in the first month of the pandemic when many of the temporary disconnection protections were in place. Now, if we expand this out, multiply it out um, to form the entire US um, population of low income residents, we can see that this is almost 1 million households that were disconnected in the first month and about 2 million in the whole year before the pandemic. So we then ask ourselves what factors are correlated with energy insecurity. Uh, I won't show you the actual regression results or regression tables, but this is um, through both descriptive statistics as well as logit regression models. And what we find are that first and foremost, demographics and household makeup are of fundamental importance. And more specifically, we find that households of color, that is households that identify as black or Hispanic, are significantly more likely to be energy insecure than our white households. We also find that households with very small children residing in the house are far more likely to be energy insecure. We find that households that have at least one member who relies on an electronic medical device are also more likely to be energy insecure as well as be disconnected from their electricity provider. And we also find that one's housing conditions are of fundamental importance. Uh, and by this, I've provided several visuals for you to get a sense of, of what I mean. So when a household has holes in the wall or mold on the wall or broken HVAC systems or broken refrigerators or broken other appliances or exposed sockets, for example, these conditions are associated with a household being far um, more energy insecure. 
So we then ask ourselves whether the pandemic has exacerbated energy insecurity. And here I am presenting a graph of our regression results, but I'll talk us through this. Um, the, the three shapes, the, the circle, triangle, and the square are the three different levels of energy insecurity and inability to pay a bill all the way up to being disconnected. And uh, what we can see here is that as a result of the pandemic, um, those that received a stimulus check um, were better able to avoid being disconnected from their electricity provider. Those that experienced new forms of material hardship from the pandemic were much more likely to be energy insecure. Um, those that lost work hours due to the pandemic were much more likely to be energy insecure. And those that had symptoms of COVID or were um, were actually prescribed or diagnosed with COVID were more likely to be unable to pay their energy bill. So in short, um, there are very specific factors that we find that correlate with energy insecurity. And we also find that these conditions got much worse during the pandemic. And there are very specific shocks associated with the pandemic that led to these higher rates of energy insecurity. So just a few additional results as we've monitored these families over time. Here I'm presenting the three different measures of energy insecurity at the wave one, two, and three time periods. And what you can see here is that rates of energy insecurity got worse over the time period, specifically the inability to pay the bill and receiving a disconnection notice. It's also the case that the disparities that I described in households dem household demographics got much worse as well. Um, we can see here that just in the third wave of data, so September through January, um, that the disparities between white households and black and Hispanic households respectively got much larger. And in fact, the, um, the rates between the two got larger. So here we can see that black households, for example, are about 3.5 times more likely to be disconnected from their service provider than a white household. We also see that coping strategies can be quite dangerous. Um, so here, this is in the most recent um, wave of data, wave three, and we can see what types of activities the households are engaging in in an attempt to stay warm. Uh, some of the more common ones, such as wearing a heavy coat, uh, are, are not dangerous, of course, um, but as you move down the bars, um, they become quite dangerous. So, for example, using a space heater in one's home, we know that using space heaters are one of the leading sources of fire. Um, using a kitchen stove, for example, about 13% of the population would use a stove and open it for space heating, or about 4% burn trash within the home to keep the home warm. So just a, a few thoughts on implications in um, conclusion. The first is I, I think that these data, as well as previous studies that come before us, um, highlight that access to energy should be guaranteed for all, and it should not be an issue of whether people are able to pay. Uh, second, energy insecurity is an immense national problem. It's an immense international problem as well. And we know from our research that it's gotten worse during the pandemic. And it's really important to provide immediate policy assistance and protections to these vulnerable populations, as well as some kind of solution for the mounting debt that households are acquiring over this time period. Third, um, there are deep disparities that we find in the rates of energy insecurity across the population that we sample, and we find these to be deeply problematic and vexing and require a lot more research. Uh, so on that fourth point, more information, more research is needed, including data on utility disconnections, as well as monitoring energy insecurity across this population and a broader population on a regular basis. So let me end with this slide, and this is um, to get us thinking deeply or more deeply about um, some of the types of policy prescriptions. Here I've included the three different types of energy insecurity in terms of severity and the, the gray arrows suggest um, that this is almost a perpetual cycle, right? Even after a household could get disconnected, once they're reconnected, they could in fact return to a state of being unable to pay their energy bills. Uh, here I've provided in yellow and down low some of the policy mechanisms um, that governments can put in place to help at various stages of energy insecurity, including more preventative measures such as improving the weatherization of one's home and energy efficiency, for example, and then measures to help a household once they're struggling to pay their energy bills by providing bill assistance. And once a household is in the condition or, or facing the conditions where they are receiving a notice for disconnection, that is when states or the federal government can put in place disconnection protections to make sure that people aren't disconnected. And then finally, when a household is disconnected, uh, government can think through debt um, recovery or, or efforts to essentially help these households with their debt. 
Now up top, I've also put in orange uh, and I'd encourage us orange uh, policy mechanisms and interventions. And this is to encourage us to not just think about the specific energy insecurity kinds of policy mechanisms, but to acknowledge that this is a much broader problem and that there are various um, other kinds of complex interactions that are making energy insecurity worse. Um, so for example, we should think about discriminatory practices. We should think about building trust between the utility and the customer. We should think about the way that we charge electricity consumers and whether the rates are equitable. And we should think about our housing policies. So with that, I'll stop and I look forward to Q&A. Thank you so much. Uh, I really appreciate that, uh, Sonia. Um, and uh, that's a very good segue. Um, into our next presentation by Dr. Jenny Stevens. Um, and uh, Dr. Stevens, um, I know you are one of the things that the last presentation obviously points out is that um, we still have uh, systemic racism in our energy system and energy insecurity. Um, and you are going to talk about um, anti-racism and feminist leadership on the energy transition. I'm looking forward to that. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thank you. Um, great to be here. And um, what I would like to do is kind of broaden, and as you mentioned, perfect segue from uh, Sonia Carley's talk um, to kind of, so what can we do about it, right? And it's not just specific policy measures to try to help um, the specific inequities but um, really we need larger transformation and that's what the energy transition is really about. And so I've been working on climate and energy um, my whole career, so about 20 plus years. And um, we've been talking about the same kinds of things uh, these 20 years and we have not been accelerating the transformation away from fossil fuels toward a more renewable based future um in the ways that we could have or should have right and and so what i uh recently right before the pandemic um wrote a book called diversifying power why we need anti-racist feminist leadership on climate and energy and i actually finished the book after the pandemic had started um so it is inter interconnected and and what the pandemic has revealed is the depths of the systemic changes that are needed uh, to simultaneously address the climate crisis, the structural racism, um, the housing crisis, the economic injustices and economic crises, the housing um, uh, crisis and, and the health crisis, right? That, that we have such disparate health impacts and, and access to healthcare as well. So what the, the pandemic and, and what the previous presentation showed is how the pandemic has revealed the depths of, our, of the systemic problems that we have and also provides a disruption that, that calls for us to um, accelerate our work and toward a, a larger transformation in society. And that's what I would like to, to talk about in, in the, the time that I have here. Um, so I um, look at this uh, and, and like to begin by pointing out that the climate and energy crises that we're in and the reason we haven't been effective in trans, one of the reasons to transform our energy system you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, um, is because of concentration of wealth and power. Um, this just shows the last 40 years of wealth and income. This is in the United States, widening income and wealth gaps. Um, and that is, we don't think of that as connected to energy transitions, but it actually is because so many of the top 1% um, are profiting from keeping things the way they have been and therefore actively resisting the transition. Um, so uh, Dario Kenner is a, has written about and has characterized the polluter elite, which are the um, very well-off people, corporate executives and, and others who really have been strategically investing for decades to resist this energy transition. Um, because they can continue to profit and concentrate their wealth and power by sustaining the fossil fuel um, 
reliance that we all that we all have. So all the analysis that we as academics can do, um, including in some of the previous presentations about what percentage we rely on fossil fuel and um, and all the different sectors um, are, are is all very important. And if we don't acknowledge the power dynamics, the analysis of our academic work um, isn't going to make a difference uh, because we're not addressing the the root of why the, we have been so ineffective in our transition so far. So. Um, the polluter elites have been investing strategically in a misinformation campaign to deny climate science. They've also been um, investing to undermine public trust in government and minimize worker protections and worker rights. It used to be that corporate culture was companies were proud of how they invested in their workers, um, but it's shifted. There's been a, a cultural shift um, to be prioritizing all about profits for shareholders and actually minimize how much uh, workers are, are supported. So um, this is pre-pandemic, this figure. During the pandemic, this has gotten even worse, right? The billionaires have become even more billionaire and most people are much, much worse off now than they were before the pandemic. So this is completely unsustainable and this is what we need to address if we are to um, be effective in, in accelerating and a larger transformation. So I propose um, that we really have had a crisis in leadership um, with energy and, and climate. And a lot of that is uh, because of who has been involved in framing the, the problem and the solutions. Um, and we've we've tended to be have a very kind of scientific technical uh, approach that um, has been based on kind of climate as an isolated problem that we you know it doesn't seem to be anyone's top issue um, oftentimes in the political landscape and so it's been kind of kept off as a separate issue for a long time thought about very much in a technocratic lens thinking about ways, okay, how can we control and manipulate the climate system uh, to reduce the impacts? But by, by looking at it in that way, we've missed opportunities for connecting with the human condition and, and how to actually invest in people and communities and what people need. Um, so I propose a, a different lens that's really effective for this larger transformative vision of acknowledging we need to move away from fossil fuels toward a renewable-based future and that is an opportunity. Not only does it address the climate crisis, but it really provides us with a structure and uh, mechanisms to invest in people and in communities and to base our, those investments on social justice and human dignity. What do people need? How, um, how can we dis distribute resources and um, in ways that um, are equitable and, and, and just? And how can we leverage the urgency for transformation um, from the climate crisis to have actually all this social benefit that has nothing to do with climate, right? Um, and that's what several of the other speakers also were, were talking about in terms of energy access and how energy um, really is um, an essential human right at this point. So um, in, in my book, I talk about we need different kind of leadership. If we keep with the same mindset that we've had for the past 20, 30 years, um, we're not gonna, we can't expect anything different. So what I think we need is um, really different kind of leadership, um, particularly anti-racist feminist leadership, which I define as leadership that acknowledges the power dynamics and acknowledges that we have all kinds of policies, practices, and processes that are intentionally um, advantage, giving uh, preference and advantage to some and disadvantaging and, and actually being oppressive and extractive of others. Um, and if, if we acknowledge that and we acknowledge how our energy system is actually integrally related and, and a part of that, then we can bring this very different kind of leadership that, that leads us to very different kinds of energy policies that accelerate the transfer, transition. So anti-racist feminist leadership um, 
for me is is characterized by the squad who came on the national stage in the United States just in the past two and a half years. And they really um, have connected climate and energy to uh, jobs and economic justice. They've connected it to structural racism and connected to the housing crisis. And, um, and, and then based their, their activism and their po proposed policies on distributing wealth and power rather than further concentrating wealth and power. So really prioritizing investments in communities um, that are based on social justice, racial justice, and economic justice, and reducing inequities and disparities rather than um, exacerbating them. And what another critical piece here is leveraging transformation in our energy system, which is fundamental, which is what we're all here talking about, but by linking it to other problems, not thinking about the energy system in isolation, um, which is really, um, thank you, uh, really important. So obviously the, the more traditional leadership that we've seen um, is based on domination and exclusion and concentrating wealth and power by giving more benefits and profits and advantage to those who already have those uh, advantages. And um, that kind of leadership, traditional patriarchal leadership also is all focused on denying that we have systemic problems because if you deny that there's a problem, then you don't need to change anything, right? And it's the way to sustain the status quo. Um, and that is that type of framing and, and leadership is has been too pervasive um, and has really um, caused so much uh, suffering. Um, and and that the pandemic now has revealed um, even the depths of that and, and, and the opportunity that we have now is that, that because of the disruption of the pandemic, we can actually envision bigger, deeper public investments, uh, massive public investments in, in all kinds of um, areas that are related to and consistent with the energy trans transformation. So, um, I'm going to quickly go through the other areas, um, but not in any depth because of the time constraints here. But but basically, the rest of my book that, if anyone's interested, um, um, goes through actually innovative, creative leaders who are connecting climate and energy and working toward energy transformation through innovative, creative ways that is that is different than the mainstream ways. So. Um, we have leaders who are resisting the polluter elite, all of the influence of the fossil fuel industry that has been resisting the transformation. Um, then we have leaders who are connecting climate energy to jobs and economic justice, and not just creating jobs, but also workforce training and, and making sure that, um, that the, the new jobs in a renewable-based future are accessible and distributed. Um, and then all kinds of leaders who are connecting the energy transformation to health, well-being, and nutritious food for all. Um, and then transportation, obviously a key piece, um, and, and some really innovative ideas are coming up that are beyond electric vehicles and really thinking holistically about transportation for all and how providing access to transportation, including free public transportation, um, is, is really critical. And then finally, connecting with housing and the housing crisis that we, that we are in, and the, the idea that we should be, we need pu massive public investments in housing so that um, people are, um, and that housing really needs to be um, considered a human, a human right. So I will end here with just um, this, this book that, I, that I'm drawing from here is, is not really an academic book. It's more of a call to action and a call for all of us to get involved in deeper transformative work. Um, and when I talk about leadership, I think of all of us as leaders, not just uh, you know, the CEOs of companies or the head of department or um, uh, elected officials, but we all in our communities, in our families, in our organizations um, can act as leaders, inspire others to act as leaders and really opening up 
and, and resisting the legacy policies and processes and practices that continue to uh, marginalize some and give uh, preference and, and a greater concentration of wealth and power to others. Um, so I'll end here by just um, acknowledging Mary Robinson, who's the former president of Ireland and really a climate justice, energy justice advocate internationally. And she has said that this kind of an approach is really just putting a people first, right? It shouldn't necessarily seem so radical, um, um, but if we put people first, what do people need? How can we invest in structured society in ways that um, people have their basic needs met? We, we could be in very different, very different place. And I also mentioned here Shirley Chisholm, who was the first black woman to run for president of the United States in 1972. Um, and in some ways we've come a long way since then, in other ways um, we still have a long, long way to go. Um, I, and if anyone is interested in, in buying the book, all the author proceeds go to the NAACP's Climate and Environmental Justice Program. And uh, I look forward to, to questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's um, so interesting and important. And we already and we do have questions, which is exciting. Um, and we'll get to those soon. Um, our, our last speakers on this panel uh, are from U of H or currently with U of H. Um, and that's Alfonso Lopez de la Escribana and Oban Zhao. Um, and they're going to be discussing uh, how state actors in climate litigation uh, have interacted in the energy transition. So I'm going to um, add the spotlight for them and I am going to turn it over to you all. Hey, thank you very much, Victor. Can you hear me well? Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you so much. So, well, um, then my name is Alfonso Lopez de Laosa. We are just a little bit uh, shorter with the time, I'm sharing this presentation with my colleague, Oban Zau. We are going to talk about the role of climate litigation in the energy transition, making a special reference to the French jurisprudence. So as an introduction, say that the energy transition uh, currently in the world, but also in France is related, of course, to climate change. Nations, administrations, states, are playing a decisive role in that matter, and of course, also friends. As a simple reminder, and as we are going to dive into aspects of jurisdiction, I would like to say that in France, administrative court, administrative law structures a very specific legislation, type of legislation, and also specific, special and specific jurisdiction. And this is proper to public law, and these are the administrative courts. Since the French Revolution in 1789, there was this creation of a specialized judge that would know about public service mandates and issues, general interest, and also they would have a specific judge knowing about the technicalities of the administration and that would protect citizens. Today, administrative courts and judges are also knowing about climate change. We have to say that uh, according to the codify or Napoleonic type of system, administrative judges can remind administration about the responsibilities uh, related to the energy transition world. In France, no private uh, judge, I would say private judge, uh, civil judge, con considered private law judge, can remind the, the state or the nation about it. But why is the French notion of energy transition? This is what we would like to, to reflect in here, which is uh, in which context the energy transition jurisdictional decisions are taking. If for example, the French government fails to take further action to reduce greenhouse emission, can it be considered as violating domestic law and international law? So let's say, let's see first this energy transition no notion a la Francaise, as I say. Uh, as uh, Professor de Fontenelle mentioned uh, about the need of law, in France, relatively recently, we are witnessing what we call a legislative motorization, an excess of laws. That excess, or at least many laws that are being um, enacted, adopted to be uh, complying with the energy transition process. This concerns for adapting the legal system. We can notice that. We have a law in 2015 on green growth energy transition. We have another law in 2019 on energy and climate. And 
precisely now, currently in a legislative process, we find the bill project 3875 uh, on fighting against climate change and strengthening resilience facing its effects. There is a multi-semantic energy transition notion. So I'm going to go through concepts that are going to help us narrow or define what we understand by um, energy transition. So we read, for example, in the 2015 law, the notion of positive energy, high environmental performance, development of renewable energies. France must be exemplary in energy and environment, it said to, the, to France. We have to build uh, with low carbon footprint. We talked about building and infrastructure today, minimizing the contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. Also, to have energy performance work, we have to evaluate this performance. We have to give, we will give bonuses to the ones applying it, and we also will provide penalties to ones that are not respecting it. Not anymore from a financial dimension, quien contamina paga, the person that contamines, that is going to generate the, the pollution is going to pay, but also with a criminal dimension from then, from now on. We are going to allocate, uh, to allocate sorry, subsidies, and help the most vulnerable and underserved population, joining, of course, what Jenny Stephens was mentioning about how the uh, pandemic has exacerbated the inequalities. And of course, the precarité énergétique, so this fight, this fight against fuel poverty. Priority in the energy transition, network and accessibility to, to territories. Professor de Fontenelle is an expert about the notion of a territory. There is a dimension of geographic dimension here that is also connected to public transportation. The law in 2015 also wanted to involve citizens. So Europe is really already moving towards this involvement of citizens in the energy transition process. And we are going to see specifically on how the bill project of 2021 is, has been created, just the text of the project involving citizens. Energy and climate law, the law in 2019, from then we can highlight uh, in order to give this definition of energy transition, the notion of ecological and climate emergency. So uh, that was introduced by 2019 and in 2019, and we're going to see how the jurisprudence of the Conseil d'État among others already talked about this urgency. Um, gradual phasing out of fossil fuels, renewable energy could be also aspect that would help us narrow this notion ecological crisis that it's mentioned by this 2021 bill, carbon neutral society that we need to be more resilient, fairer and united, uh, the decarbonization uh, and the circular economy, uh, as you know, uh, not producing waste. And if we produce weight is the minimum and we try to keep products and maintain them in a very graphical way. Support the ecological transition, uh, empowering local uh, authorities that normally in France as a traditionally Jacobin or centralized state that has been for the last 20, 25 years being decentralized. It's interesting to see how the local authorities are empowered. So this geographic dimension we were talking about. We strengthen the power of local elected officials to experiment, regulate and control energy transitions. And we support all citizens in this transition. Um, and we support uh, in this transition to society to be more respectful to nature and more balanced. And also an educational aspect. It's interesting to read the preamble of 2021 bill project. We need to understand the challenges of climate change. Professor de Fontenelle talked as well about the complexity. There are very complex um, scientific notions and measurements and statistics that need to be understood by the public, by the society. And the bill is already taking this into account. So information on products can be also notion of energy transition, environmental justice, but the, again, joining Jenny Stephens about the notion of ecological crimes, how to be penalized and how to protect uh, the environment. Uh, the bill 2021 project that I was mentioning, empowering the citizen, create a very unique way of involving, uh, involving citizens. It's called the participatory democracy. Uh, President Macron uh, created the Citizens' Convention for the Climate uh, for involving 150 citizens that were taking, chosen randomly from the whole society, from different backgrounds to represent, uh, to help the legislator in issuing 
this project big. So we can see this intention of involving society, involving society, transmitting democracy to the very first level, and also, of course, targeting social justice. This is precisely the document that it's now in process. The energy transition falls within the framework of traditional administrative litigation. Uh, this would be my uh, second part after the notion that we have seen of energy transition. There have been three decisions that after uh, Obama is going to, to talk about them, the Conseil d'État, Assembly July 10, and uh, the one decision, uh, another decision from the Conseil d'État, Commune Grande Sainte, uh, and another one, the Administrative Court of February 3, 2021. So basically uh, in all of them, the state, the, the nation, the administration is, uh, is requested to give more information about what they are doing. Uh, six months in the Conseil d'État 2020, about what they are doing to fight climate change. Administrative Court 2021, two months also to provide these, um, what are the steps taking to fight uh, against climate change. And uh, Grand Sainte, the same, well request, the same as well, requesting more documents. So we are identifying, and this is, might be interesting for those who are uh, administrative law uh, strict, um, I would say professors or, or, or lawyers working about it. It's, we are going to identify the typical classic administrative legislation with the notions that we normally identify, recours pour excès de pouvoir, the remedy that it's presented against the silence that was given by the president of the Republic, the prime minister and the ministry of the ecology and solidarity transition. What does it mean? It means that the, so the local authority is going to request for uh, an act for an ex uh, uh, to the, the government, the government, is silent about it, this silent vote, it's equal to rejection, and then this what uh, starts the administrative uh, procedure in front of the court. So there's an imperative, there's active leg legitimation, qualité pour agir, we, it's something that uh, I would like maybe in the question Q&A, Q &A, we have the possibility of mentioning how, what's my interest, I mean, uh, can any citizen um, bring a suit in front of the of the Conseil d'État or not, do I have to have a specific um, dedication of my time, my work and my, my association, my NGO to, to climate change aspects. The notion of ecolo ecological damage, so the different uh, aspects of the additional instruction that has been, uh, that were asked by the, um, uh, by the judge to the administration. So there's new challenges for administrative court. They are becoming hyper-specialized in environmental and climate change. They are experts speaking, memory circulating. There are complexity about the different national, European and international law. There's a friction that shouldn't be, but there exists. There's a French paradox. Uh, we will see by the, we could see by having more time, but a deeper analysis of the legislation and the jurisprudence that we have mentioned. On one hand, France is one of the most active countries implementing climate change policies. But on the other hand, we see from the administrative judge a certain condescension, a certain permissiveness, not condemning them directly, as we have seen in Urgenda with, with the, in the Netherlands from, from this district court, not condemning them directly, but giving them opportunity, giving them two months, three months, yeah, to, to bring instructions, six months to comply. If not, yes, it's true, a 10 million euros um, fee. But this certain per per permissiveness, it's interesting to be seen. Society is pushing, is pushing very uh, strongly the judge to condemn more. The administration, we are in the middle of a media coverage of climate disputes that is, is sometimes uh, too overwhelming. And we can see that the French judge is intending to catch up this delay in climate policy litigation. So that's it, uh, what I wanted to share with you. I'm going to give the panel to my colleague, Oban Zaou. Oban, the panel is yours. Thank you, Alfonso. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for giving us uh, uh, quite an interesting overview of, uh, of uh, the concept of energy transition and, uh, the, and also uh, of uh, the climate litigation, the way that it is unfolding in France. And as uh, Professor Alfonso as just stated, the uh, energy transition uh, issues are uh, present in French court room uh, by means of uh, climate litigation. And uh, at the outset, uh, this poses new challenges to, um, to the French administrative uh, judges. 
um, first, they do not have an independent uh, expertise in the field, and they must um, mostly rely on uh, facts uh, admitted between parties. And another layer of the complexity comes from the cluster of, uh, uh, of applicants, including um, uh, a coalition of actors, NGOs, individuals, uh, sub-state entities, uh, with the support of uh, external nonprofit seeking to intervene during the uh, court proceedings uh, to double down the, the urgency of action or to, um, to support the necessity of a claim. Uh, in addition to the grassroots um, pressure outside the courtroom, uh, it appears that French administrative judges are, are facing uh, many types of claims, including preventive and, uh, and proactive claims, but also um, claims in reparation of uh, ecological damage. So um, we, we are going to walk through uh, the cases that Professor Alfonso uh, as just mentioned. The first and uh, focus, try to focus on um, uh, four specific points to cut, uh, just cut it to the chase. Uh, the first is, uh, the first point is to uh, establish uh, the specific obligation, obligations um, um, uh, 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 that must be borne by the state. And this point is being um, mostly uh, held by um, uh, NGOs, nonprofits, individuals, and uh, sub-state entities that are involved in uh, climate litigation before French administrative courts. Here, most of uh, the plaintiff argue argue that um, um, uh, that such obligations derive from international law, uh, European law, and are transposed uh, into a national law. For example, when it comes to, um, to taking ambitious and, uh, um, and necessary measures to, uh, to design and implement climate and uh, energy policies, but also uh, to set up new policies with clearly and precisely uh, defined objectives, uh, but also with uh, a realistic trajectory uh, as to as to carbon neutrality. In the association Les Amis de la Terre France ruling on uh, July 12, 2017, the French Conseil d'État admitted uh, the obligation of the state to establish uh, an air quality plan in specific areas with the purpose of uh, reducing the concentration of fine particles and, uh, and nitrogen dioxide uh, to the limit uh, values laid by the 2008 European uh, Directive on, air, on Ambient Air Quality, uh, which had been transposed uh, within uh, the French Code of the Environment. Uh, therefore, the French Conseil d'État had set a deadline for implementation in the shortest uh, possible time and ordered uh, the notification of the new policies to the European Commission before March 31st, uh, 2018. The second is um, the failure, uh, mostly the failure of the state uh, to comply with a specific obligation um, uh, as to, to be seen as um, a cause of the aggravation of climate change and potential impossibility of remedy. Uh, in L'Affaire du Siècle, uh, Association Oxfam France, among others, claimed that the state failure to meet targets as regards the general obligations to combat climate change, to uh, improve energy efficiency, to deploy the share of renewable energy in overall cons consumption uh, causes uh, ecological damage by way of uh, its aggravation and also could uh, lead to the impossibility of, remedy of remedying it. So the admin administrative uh, tribunal of Paris made a judgment on February 3rd, 2021, stating that the ecological damage invoked by the applicant uh, must be seen as established. 
uh, that the state did not respect the first carbon budget and, most, uh, and must be considered partially responsible. And the, the, the third is at least uh, the attempt to establish the justiciability of provisions of uh, the Paris Agreement. Uh, the judge is also asked in uh, the context of, uh, of French administrative uh, law to recognize the direct effects of articles two, three, and four of the Paris Agreement regarding uh, the implementation of uh, measures uh, related to, um, to adaptation to climate change in order to allow individuals uh, to directly invoke uh, uh, those uh, provisions before national courts um, in relations with uh, uh, between state uh, and, and individuals and also in relations between individuals. In the Commune de Grande Sainte case, the French Conseil d'État ruling on uh, November 19, uh, 2020, considered that the stipulation of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement require the, inter the intervention of uh, complement complementary uh, national acts to produce effect with regard with private individuals and are therefore devoid of uh, direct effect. Yet, they must contribute to the interpretation of the provisions of uh, national law. Fourth and last, uh, the failure of uh, the state to meet its climate obligations is susceptible to be sanctioned. Um, uh, here, uh, let's go directly to uh, the judgment, um, uh, the, the ruling of uh, the French Conseil. Actually, I, I apologize. I'm just going to step in um, for one moment. Um, and because we have one of our panelists that's going to have to leave sharp. Uh, so I'm hoping you can continue part four after we do a couple of questions and then we'll come back to questions and then lead into the conclusion. I'm very sorry to interrupt you, but I at least wanted to get the questions in. Um, and so I'm just gonna briefly add a spotlight uh, if our uh, panel could all come on, um, I will add uh, the spotlight um, to you uh, when I'm trying to do that here. Um, Okay, Dr. Carley, uh, I know you have to leave soon, and I, I did have one question that was that was posed for you. You answered one of them sort of because the question is about um, solutions, essentially, to the energy injustice. And of that solution, um, you noted uh, that um, like efficiencies could help, and you talked about that in the first thing in terms of adding efficiency. What I would like to um, additionally ask you is you also pointed out that we may need to think about, you know, energy, providing energy as a right. And as a, have, you, have you thought about the idea that um, the, an issue of energy as a right is, comes into the same problem as water as a right, right? Because energy can be a human right and it can be a commodity. Unfortunately, in our current delivery systems, they're delivered in the same way, right? So how do you change the physical, social, or regulatory environment to facilitate energy being uh, given as a right? Well, I appreciate your, your question. I think it's an excellent one. And I, I think it's also important to note that these forms of insecurity, they tend to correlate together. So if a household is energy insecure, they're also often water insecure and food insecure as well. Um, so thinking about them in a coordinated way, I think is, is uh, a good idea. Um, one way to ensure that we provide it as a right is through direct mandates is just one option that we could mandate that no utility provider, whether it's water or electricity, is allowed to, um, to cut off service. But then of course we need to have some kind of backup solutions or additional solutions that help those companies um, or even the government that might be the, the service provider recover the cost that they lose as a result of, of those extra protections. Great, thank you. Um, and I know you have to go, so if you, <laughs> if you need to go off, I will, but um, you may wanna, if you can hang on for a couple of just other questions. Uh, the next group of questions, it's actually related to um, what we're calling private environmental governance, right? That 
we have seen a lot of activity from the private sector uh, being based on responses to consumers, shareholders, media pressure, social media pressure, et cetera. And the question to you um, with relation to that, Dr. Stevens, is if we're thinking about the polluter elite, right, as the, the, the corporate behemoths that have profited, can shareholder or consumer pressure ever be put on them? Can, can we ever align their profit motives with solving the inequity problems of the energy distribution? Yeah, well, I think with the um, pandemic, when we see so many of the billionaires become, and corporates, you know, profiting even more, um, I think we are getting to a point where people are saying, you know, this is, we can't keep doing this. It doesn't, we know something, some kind of intervention here needs to happen. And, and, you know, you could hope that some of the corporates and billionaires themselves would start advocating for redistributing some of that wealth to pay to the people who are really struggling. Um, but we haven't seen a whole lot of that yet. Um, so, so there's, I mean, there's definitely opportunity for the elites of both private, private sector corporations as well as individuals to get involved themselves. Um, but then there's also, you know, there also needs to be uh, changes in our tax code and, and government um, uh, policies of, of, that continues to allow this uh, extravagant discrepancies. So I think it's, it's both and. Um, so yes, there is, there is opportunity for shareholders and consumers to demand of companies to uh, be engaged on these issues. Thank you. Um, and with that uh, uh, same concept of the pressures of uh, the consumers and shareholders, we've seen that in the last year and we've seen it come through, particularly during the pandemic, that renewable energy um, uh, projects, if you will, have been favored by financial institutions, whereas uh, coal projects, et cetera, have been disfavored by financial institutions, providing what I would call even um, more favorability to renewables. And my question for you, Dr. Mornhout, is, is that, could that also possibly explain the slight renewable bump up during COVID um, as opposed to it all being related uh, to just the switch in time of, of use of the power? I mean, absolutely, definitely. And I think generally renewable, energy investments are just more reliable, right? If, if we just take some, some projections um, 20 years into the future, by 2040, more than half of the energy that we're going to add, sorry, electricity, more than half of the electricity that we're going to add worldwide is going to be solar and wind. So it's clear which companies you, you kind of want to be investing in. It's also companies which have a, a very large market in the, in the coming years. Um, and in, in the West, that's just not anymore for, for coal. Um, and if I may quickly kind of jump on, on the previous point, um, related to, to either energy justice um, and, and to this point you're making, I think we really need to put front and center the issue of fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, the tax code was mentioned, but if you reform those fossil fuel subsidies to, to producers, right, not, not to consumers, but to producers, um, that can tip the balance even, even quicker. And a lot of those uh, subsidies is, is just an absolute uh tragedy one of the can i give, just give one example because it's, it's an interesting one in the united states one of the the biggest fossil fuel subsidies is depletion allowance it's not necessary to explain what it is um but that depletion allowance has been there for a hundred years the drafter of the bill has uh, acknowledged uh black and white on historical record that they chose a certain tax reduction based on absolutely nothing just because they could claim it and they knew they could get along with it Ever since Harry Truman, other presidents have said that this is the most glaring loophole in the tax code and it's still not reformed. Like those things are, are both uh, an injustice and just an absolute waste of, of money, public, uh, public money. Thank you. And I, I, I brought uh, Dr. Field back into the conversation as well, because one of our questions uh, again has to do with the energy transition in Africa and how it relates to justice. So the question, the heart of the question is, since Africa is, is needing to rely or is planning to rely on natural gas as a transition fuel at least, 
uh, and to support its more distributed energy future. Um, how does that interact with the new pushes, at least in Europe and the United States, to really try to target the elimination of all fossil fuel distribution, in, including like natural, uh, excuse me, liquefied natural gas export, um, stop a funding of new pipelines, et cetera. And I guess I'm sorry to, uh, this is a long question, but the last point of that is, doesn't that itself bring up an equity concern that the, the countries that are most developed are saying no to natural gas that may be necessary for the transition in Africa. And I'm not saying whether it is or isn't. Thanks for the question, Victor. And, and yes, of course. And I think this is a, a multidimensional question and it raises the whole issue of ecological debt owed to Africa for the natural resources that were extracted during colonial and post-colonial times. It, it raises the question of, you know, these, the amount that, of energy that Africa uses and produces compared to the rest of the world. Um, surely African nations have a right to use their resources. And if they're not to use their resources, can we resurrect the argument about payment for gas in the ground? Um, you know, we're all aware that Ecuador tried that and failed because of a, a failed response from the developed world. But you know, it's not just a gas, it's oil. We're talking about fracking in the Okavango Basin. Surely this is time for the world to step up and say, Africa, we recognize this issue and we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to, to come to the party. Otherwise, what choice do African nations have? Well, and since especially most of the growth in population and energy usage is expected to come from Africa. Uh, exactly. For the next several decades. Um, so um, we've, we've, we've sort of uh, brought some of this together with the idea of energy accessibility and uh, energy equity um, and some of the conflicts and issues there and, and conflicts with the private sector and equity. And I wanna just bring it back in our conclusion, um, again, sorry to have interrupted, but I wanna bring it back to Aubin and Alfonso um, who are looking at the very specific litigation issues um, so we're sort of operating in, in multi-spheres. We have a sphere that's operating um, regulatorily. We have a sphere that's operating privately. We have a sphere that's international agreements. And we have sort of the legal overview on top of that and, and how much that actually is moving the energy transition. So I want to give the last word uh, to Aubin uh, to finish his presentation and to offer concluding remarks. Thank you. Great, Th thank you, thank you, Victor. Uh, so uh, the the last the last point is uh, related to the failure of the state to meet uh, to meet its uh, climate uh, its climate obligations um, and um, and and being um, in in turn um, uh, uh, susceptible to be uh, sanctioned. So following the the judgments. Uh, the judgment of uh, July 12, 2017, uh, and because of a partial execution, another petition uh, by, Associa uh, by Association Les Amis de la Terre France allowed the French Conseil d'État to emphasize uh, in its ruling of July 10, uh, 2020, uh, that in view of the seriousness um, of the consequences of public health and, uh, and uh, air quality, Bearing in mind the particular urgency deri deriving from it, it was appropriate um, to impose on the state a periodic penalty payment of, of uh, uh, 10 million euros per semester, per, per semester until the completion of uh, the execution of the decision um, uh, by the French state. And if the state did not justify within six months having designed and implemented um, air quality plants in targeted areas. Also, the Administrative uh, tri Tribunal of Paris, uh, in its judgment on uh, February 3rd, 2021, upheld that it had recognized the state as responsible for ecological damage. Uh, but uh, the request by the applicants for a symbolic 
payment of one euro as com uh, compensation for the ecological damage was um, unrelevant and unrelated to the to the importance of the ecological damage. Unfortunately, they failed, uh, said the court, uh, to prove that the state would be unable to compensate in kind for such damage. In conclusion, there is no doubt about uh, the, the momentum here uh, the, with the uh, periodic penalty payment in uh, uh, the um, Association Les Amis de la Terre case, or the state being bound to justify uh, its uh, trajectory when it comes to carbon uh, neutrality in a com uh, grand commune de grande Sainte case, or the partial responsibility uh, uh, evoked in uh, uh, l'affaire du, du siècle case. But I can just echo critics uh, voiced by Professor Alfonso regarding the French administrative courts um, uh, being more protective of the state, uh, which explained uh, their hesitancy to sanction uh, at the outset the French state and rule over the behavior of the French state um, in uh, climate matters. So I will just stop that because we are running out of time. Alfonso, do you have any concluding remarks? Yes, thank you very much, Victor. Well, what a seminar, so rich and interesting from the importance of Africa and the future that I'm sure it's going to be very promising. We would love to see Africa joining the party. Professor Phil, it would be excellent to the fact that um, uh, there is uh, there have been aspects through after COVID of safety issue that Professor Salil exposed and how important it is in terms of renewable energy and, and nuclear energy to retrofit, repurpose and rejuvenate. Professor de Fontenelle exposed the, the crisis and the, and the interconnection of crisis, health, economic, social crisis, and the importance of the, to face this convergence, convergence of crisis uh, to empower the law, that the law which should integrate and consider the problems of recomposing, recomposing and um, facing the issues on environmental climate. Um, Tom Morenhut uh, exposes also uh, very well the impact that directly had the COVID in the energy, but that was temporary and uh, the emission reductions that had to be uh, respected, most of all, highlighting the importance in buildings and infrastructures and the main challenges that exist to it. Sanya Carly uh, about uh, exposed us very well the clear problem of um, uh, energy insecurity that we faced in Texas. Basically, I'm a good, very good example that we really all live the ones living in Texas, the storm power outage, uh, outage, and how we are trying to cope with these strategies. So, what is energy insecurity? Uh, what is the impact of uh, in the households of this energy insecurity? Yeah, there is a very interesting research project that has been carried and, and we could see the results of it. Jenny Stephen talked about the larger transformation uh, of uh, needed after COVID and how we have to empower society and citizens to face and reverse the economic injustice that existed and the COVID exacerbated, empowering as well women in the presence of um, energy transition. Professor Robin, uh, this, this um, very good analysis of what we consider very complex litigation. The judge, the administrative judge in France is becoming now an expert in climate change. Uh, it was to see, to read the, the, the decisions that are really climate change uh, engineering decisions, analyzing the PM10, the particles, the dioxide, and et cetera, to see if this, the country, the nation is doing really something of gate against climate change. So very rich, very interesting. The seminar is going to be recorded. So to all of you that would like to watch it twice, it will be soon available at the inner page. So we would like to thank you all of you for your attendance. It has been a very, very interesting. Stay tuned for all the activities of the Energy Center. We would love to have you as well with us. Thank you again. Thank you, Alfonso. And thank you everyone for joining us. We've appreciated your time and your patience and for an exciting program that the recording will be up and you will hear from us about the recording in CLE after the conference. Thank you. Goodbye.